Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Strange Road. I'm your host, Mikey, and of course, always riding shotgun, the bro host, Bub. Hey. And tonight, we got Stoner and Disbro in Master Control. Rolling deep. <clears throat> Rolling super deep tonight. They're making everything look and sound amazing, as usual. And, uh, you know, I think tonight, something different, Bub. We haven't uh, had this type of guest on yet. You nope. know, we've had a lot of paranormal episodes. Yep. We've had archaeological, uh, archaeological kind ufology, of ancient civilization, ufology, biology. Um, but this one is uh, an interest of mine. We've we've shared together for a very long time. Yeah. Um, the subject of psychedelics and yep. psychedelic research and some of the things that are happening is right now in modern society. So exciting that hasn't seen research since really the late 50s and early 60s um, before the counterculture they movement closed the door for a while. Kind of. You know, uh, a negative, uh, the, the research, the folks that kind of just went a little too hard yeah. and uh, it, it ended up uh, people getting freaked out over psychedelics and the hippie movement and the anti-war movement. Well, There's a lot of political things on the back end that's kind of happening with all of that. It kind of got baited <clears throat> into being banned. Yeah, yeah. the war on drugs, yeah. uh, which admittedly, you know, Nixon's right-hand man years later on his deathbed admitted that it was the war on drugs was really just about putting hippies and black people in jail. Jeez. Em. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, that's kind of what we've been up against for that's the last 30 years. Yeah, and <laughs> but they couldn't go after their ideas, but they could go after the drugs they were Taking the mushrooms, psychedelics, which helped uh, the, develop the, a lot of you know, those cannabis. ideas, though, and a lot of those Absolutely. tenets of you know tune in, turn on, drop out, or however the uh, yep. mantra of uh, Leary was. But you yep. know that's what was happening, and they're like, God, we need people to fight a war. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and you know, you guys can always find us. We're at the Strange Road. We're on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Uh, we got the Strange Road Hitchhikers Group rocking and rolling. If you guys want to come on, say what's up, drop yeah. some links in there. Um, you know, like, share, subscribe, follow. Uh, if you like us, uh, like this episode, share it with your friends. Yeah. And uh, we appreciate Please. the hell out of all the listeners and any anybody watching on YouTube. Thank you guys so much. You're all the best, and uh, I think we're going to hop right into it. Uh, tonight's Let's guest uh, is, and you know, Bub, you actually found our guest tonight on Twitter, and um, so I'm super happy that you reached out to this this gentleman. Uh, Do you remember the story of me meeting Don Ink as a kid? <laughs> the first time I met Don Ink, I walked up to him. Corey never f let me forget this. I walked up to him and said, hey. Asked him for a hey, dollar? Hey, you give me a dollar? <laughs> yeah. And he was like, what? And I was like, I want to go play that bowling alley. And he was like. Okay, I think he gave me a dollar even, and I went and played. But that's kind of how this has been procured with Zeus and other guests now yeah. is, hey, I'm just going to go out there and, and try to track down interests. And if you feel like coming on, great. We have a great platform. We want to hear your yep. message and hear what's going on. So yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing that because uh, without My further pleasure. ado, our guest, Zeus Tapado, he's a neuropsychopharmacology PhD candidate at Maastricht University, which is in Holland. And he's focusing on researching the brain while under DMT inside virtual extended reality. His focus has been finding out how psychedelics can be used to help depression, anxiety, et cetera. Yeah. And without further ado, Zeus Tapado, how are you, man? What's happening? Hey, what's up, everybody? How's it going out there? Thanks for the little intro. Yes. Absolutely, really nice. man. <laughs> like it. Yes. Thank you for coming on. Yes. Yeah, yes. man. Well, thank you for having me on, dude. Absolutely. Anytime. Yeah, you, we've just been kind of following along since Bub connected with you on Twitter. We've been kind of seeing the conferences and the research and some of the articles written where you're included and different podcasts yeah. that you've been on, uh, the well, Mycelium we've been, podcast. We've been we close a couple to. times hitting on a date, right? <clears throat> Something would yeah. come up or, you know, we just we weren't really syncing up in orbits. And when this came up and you're like, hey, can we do I was like, yes. Book yeah, that right now. Out. Like, book that as soon as we can. Like, let's get that on. And with these kind of things, the universe it has to kind of align True. when it's something, you know, it, like I said, this is the first psychedelic research episode we've done where we've had an expert come on right. and talk to us. Um, so, Zeus, we just want to hear a little bit about yourself and how you got down this path of psychedelic research and how yeah. you ended up in Holland as a PhD candidate. Man, how did I get down this path of psychedelic <laughs> research? I mean, wow, wow. Well, where do I start, man? Do I start my childhood? Do I start in high school? Uh, okay, well, let me start a little bit back when I was a kid. 
Um, so I'm from Louisiana and my background is a very Creole background. So Creole, you know, you're talking about voodoo, you're talking about mm-hmm. incantations, you're talking about like sacrificing, you know, things to make things happen. So right. when I was a kid, I just believed that reality, there was this like extended reality or this like other worldly reality that can be assessed by doing certain things, like by you know, um, saying something or reading something or having a um, something inhabit a person's body. So that's just what I believed when I was a kid. I, mm-hmm. I thought that reality, there was a reality that we all are um, here and we like inhabit, but there was some other sort of other worldly reality that can only be assessed through certain things, rituals, uh, processes. And then when I was young, about eight or nine, I left Louisiana. Then I went to Texas. And that was a culture shock. Different because world. I went from <laughs> different, absolutely different world. Yeah. I like went from believing in things like <clears throat> voodoo and like spirits and being possessed to this guy named Jesus everywhere and on a cross. And he's doing this and these giant churches and giant pastors. And I'm like, what is happening? That's so I was so confused as a kid, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was, <laughs> to say the least, I was a confused kid. And uh, and so I stuck to what I understood, and that was science. I, I, I stuck to psychology. I graduated high school. I went to the University of Arizona. I, I, was, I, got, I was focusing on my bachelor in psychology. Just trying to like understand what that entire process was, like what happened during, you know, my um, childhood and these like religions and all this stuff. What was happening? And then everything was going fantastic. Everything was going great. And then I had my first psychedelic experience. I had five grams of shrooms when I was a sophomore at the University of Arizona. First time ever. That was your first experience. Wow, heroic five grams. So you went, shrooms, yeah. you went to the pool of the mind and went straight to the highest diving board and said, yep, that's the one for me. Don't You didn't even I dip a toe in the water. Shook you just, hands with the elves. Jeez. Oh, yeah. No. I, oh yeah. Gosh. Five grams, man, of dried shrooms. I took every wow. bit of it. It was a Friday evening. And, of course, I was up until Saturday afternoon. Just. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it was such an intense and profound experience. And, of course, I can get into what I saw, what I experienced. A little bit later, but it it changed my entire life. It changed my entire life to the point where I actually added a second bachelor's because I was blown away by like what I saw, and I added religion to my workload. So I was a ba- I had a bachelor in, in uh, psychology and a bachelor in religion. And I was doing both of those. Graduated, and I figured that both of those bachelors sort of equates to a psychedelic. Bachelors, you know, mm-hmm. you add a little bit of psychology, a little bit of religion, you sort of get a little psychedelic bachelors. So then, okay, done, finished with that, graduated. I'm like, okay, I don't really want to go to work right now. I want to keep on doing the whole academic scene. So then I was like, okay, I got to get a little bit further on. So I went to the University of South Wales in the UK. Wow. Nice. Went from Arizona to Wales, <laughs> wow. spoke Welsh for a little bit. Borida, Kamru, all that stuff. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> and also, Wells is a fantastic place because shrooms oh, yeah. grows everywhere. Yeah. You cannot like there are so many like shrooms that grow in these beautiful hills, these beautiful Welsh hills. They're everywhere. Liberty caps, these like little tiny shrooms about the size of your finger mm-hmm. that just grow everywhere. And don't they, are they psychedelic? Don't they also have like the highest per capita remaining like castles and structures from like medieval times anywhere in the world in Wales? I think I heard a guy's a guy from Wales at Bowser's one night mention that. Like so that would be a great environment for walking around finding some psychedelics and going and visiting some like ancient castle. Like that would be really cool. Yes, yes. So there are castles everywhere in Wales. Everywhere. Like towers and forts and like runes and all this stuff they're everywhere everywhere uh actually there's a really big castle in this place called cardiff queens which is like the sort of um center area of cardiff the uh, capital of wales and it's absolutely beautiful but i was out there and of course i did a lot of drugs while i was out there i did a lot of psychedelics i did uh, ketamine for the first time i did a lot of other things for the first time 
But I also got my master's and a and I was focused on the the sort of intersection of tech and psychedelics. And uh, I finished I, my uh, thesis was I believe that there was a communication chain that happens when tech communicates with people and when psychedelics essentially talks to people as well. Mm -hmm. I believe those two things were sort of the same. And I wrote an entire thesis on that, which wow. is somewhere buried in the library in Wales. If you want to go check it out, <laughs> University wow. of South Wales. Yeah, I think I have a copy of it somewhere. But yeah, so anyways, then I got back here and I was like, okay, what am I going to do with this crazy, like, bat like two bachelors and a master's that are like psychedelic focus? So I was like, okay, what am I going to do? I don't know. Yada, yada, yada. But I'm like, okay, let me just go to California and just like do my thing there, live out there in California. So I did it. I went to California. I crashed my friend's couch. <laughs> I finally got a place and I begin writing for high times. Cool. Uh, high times is a uh, cannabis, like one of the oldest cannabis publications out there. They've been around since like 1960s or 1970s. Yeah. Hunter S. Thompson wrote for them. Very cool. Lots of uh, great people. So I wrote for them. And then I started to write for other cannabis magazines. Then I wrote for psychedelic magazines. And then uh, Snoop Dogg's people contacted me. And then I'm like, okay, let's do something. Yeah. So then I co-produced this show called Super High Score with Snoop Dogg and his production company. That's amazing. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, you can watch it on the internet, Super High Score. And that led into other things. I did stuff for <clears throat> Double Blind, which is a psychedelic uh, video or um, sort of a psychedelic information site. I did stuff for psychedelics today. And then the pandemic hit. And I'm like, okay, what am I going to do now? I can't do anything. We all can't do anything. So yeah. I got my old master's thesis out, opened it up, cracked it open, read, a, read what was happening. And then I read what was happening currently with science i'm like oh i was pretty close i was uh, i was pretty close i was pretty close i was pretty close and i was just like looking at all of these brand new papers that were being dropped on mm -hmm. psychedelic science and then i was looking at my old stuff like oh my gosh like i was pretty close to what is being discovered so uh i got in contact with jan raymakers and kim coopers in holland maastricht University. Oh, okay. uh, it's, we we talked uh, about yeah, it before the show. Yeah, I, like, I said, "How do you and pronounce then, it?" And then he we told for, me. We forgot to ask him. No, no. He told me, and I said, it's not, "I said Maastricht. we're not doing it." Maastricht is that it's, good? It's difficult. It's um, yeah, Maastricht. Yeah, that's that's close enough. It's difficult to say, dude. It's Dutch is weird. But uh, so I talk. I talked to them, and I proposed an idea. I'm like, "Hey guys, uh, let's do some research. I want to do research where I want to where I want to give people DMT." And I want to put them inside virtual reality and I want to look at their brain. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what I'm proposing is so off the wall that they're going to be like, Zeus, like, what are you talking about? Right. How, we can't do this here. And my first Zoom call, I proposed this idea to them and they took my idea and like expanded it, made it even crazier than what I wow. even thought. So wow. I was like, oh my gosh, like, who are these people? Right. <laughs> Uh, so I was like, this is who I have to be with. This is who I have to research with. So after tons of zoom calls and presentations to them and phone calls and emails, we finally agreed that it would be right for me to come out here to do my research. And here I am doing groundbreaking research that hasn't been done before. It, all this is, hasn't been done before. I'm somehow the first person to do this. And uh, with that comes great responsibility, but also great freedom. Because right. there isn't a blueprint <clears throat> to any of this. It's all right. going to be sort of guided by science and my own intuition. Yeah, you're making your own roadmap. You you're, know, there's not really a, a map for you, but you're kind of blazing your own trail, which is, uh, yeah. again, why I think we resonate with you. Yeah. There's, you know, some of the, you know, you have Rick Doblin and you have um, the McKenna's and you have uh, all these kind of uh, Paul Stamets and, and some of these guys that we've looked into their research and listen, hear, heard them talk yeah. so much over the years, watch their documentaries. And and now we have, you know, guys like Zeus and some of the, the next up and comers in this whole world. That's what's exciting to me is connecting with, like, who's the next generation that's carrying the torch, like right. Zeus, uh, but, like what with what you're doing, man. We respect 
so much of what you're doing and mm-hmm. and just breaking down those barriers for people to understand that this isn't something to play with. I mean, my thing is lately, and Duncan Trussell said it best, is like, you know, psychedelics are great for obviously curing depression and anxiety and all these things. But what about if you just want to go to a festival and you just want to have a breakthrough experience or you want to sit with your friends and you have an open heart? Uh, right. Is wine only through? for church communion? Yeah. So, you know, uh, that's kind of where I'm somewhere. I'm all of those things, not just the medical uh applications for psychedelics, but also for well, growth. You can and, look at the marijuana industry with that as far as recreational and medical, you know, there's just differentiations between maybe greater strength needed for actual medical patients because of tolerance and, you know, uh, Yeah, the medical resistance. stuff, it, you know, sure. Zeus, do you think that the medical applications is kind of what's going to break down the doors for everything else? Or be the gatekeeper. <clears throat> yeah, that's what I'm kind of worried about, too. Yeah, man. So uh, it's interesting that you actually bring that up because actually the research that I do, believe it or not, it isn't based on therapy. Mm. It's based on perception. I'm one of the few people on this planet that is doing psychedelic research for the pure understanding of how it affects our perception. Do you have Um, any mantis shrimp in your lab? Uh, no, I mean, if we do, I wouldn't be able to tell you how to okay. sense. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. So that that's, yeah, I mean, yeah. Just because of perception so, in their eye being so absolutely difficult to understand, right? Like they still don't really fully understand how their eyes work and what they're perceiving. But you saying that you have this program carved out or this pathway basically just on perception. It's not about medical treatment or therapy. It's just purely on what is it doing to what us we perceptively what when we, we take these things. Yeah, man. So that's the thing, man. Um, with the current research lines of psychedelic science, it's so heavily based on therapy, like how these mm-hmm. substances can help with anxiety, depression. And that's all super important because right. a lot of people deal with that stuff, sure. obviously, you know. And if there's a if there is a um substance that could actually help with that, then that's fantastic. We should totally research that. But I, that's not my interest. Mm -hmm. Uh, My interest is why on, let's say a Thursday evening, you could take a tab of paper and then within an, you know, um, half hour, have your entire reality redefined, have perceptual things just completely altered that right there. We still don't have a convincing explanation as to why that happens. I mean, we have Mm -hmm. some fantastic theories which are really good theories, but we do not have one concrete explanation. So I think, so really, and if you ask any person out there, not any person, but like most people, they'll say the reason why I, you know, took five grams of shrooms or two hits of LSD or whatever is because I wanted to trip. That's the reason why I wanted to have a very, you know, interesting experience. I don't really find people that have that took their first dose of psychedelics in order to treat their PTSD or, right. or, or depression. Although some people, you know, that that doesn't apply to everybody, but the vast majority of people, they take, you know, whatever substance to trip because the trip is so interesting. It's so important and so unexplained. And the thing, let's get back to what you said about this whole this sort of idea of therapeutics. The wild thing that I've been seeing at all these conferences that I go to across the whole planet, France, Germany, Amsterdam, wherever, is that there are companies out there that are actually trying to take the trip out of these subjects. I know. I read that recently. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. What's the statement? Don't California my Texas or don't New York my Florida or, you know, whatever that is with psychedelics. I'm sure there's... From what I read, they're basically... Don't take the jam out of my donut of psychedelics. They're taking this experience out. Like, they're the components that fix your brain to make these new neural pathways to cure your depression or anxiety. But the experience of how to get... How you got to that to me is so important because when you have those breakthroughs and let's say you're taking something to cure your depression, there's an experience within that trip that happens to where you either need to let go 
the ego death is coming on. Right. And you're sitting there holding on for dear life until you let go. You can't break through yeah. to have that. Maybe it gets a little bumpy. That's sure. important. That's an important part of the trip. That's why it's called a trip. Yeah. But I was also going to say to to the point of you said, you know, I think we discussed this earlier. You know, most people don't go into it like I'm trying to treat my depression or my anxiety or this or that. They go into it, you know, first time you're in college or this or that or whatever. And somebody goes, hey, let's eat these. And you go, all right, cool. Let's see what that is. I'm in for the experience. And what I think is the underpinning maybe beneath all of that is still like, the anxieties or stresses that you have that you're not aware of that when you do go through that, just for the experience, you are still rectifying so many things. And that's when people I think come out of and go, that's what that does. It's not, you know, and again, why do I be, I just want to go to a concert, but it might be, it it feels like it kind of, yeah. Clean the mental slate um, from experiences. Well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because there's actually a very powerful correlation between the extent of an actual trip and the amount of therapeutic benefits that people get from these substances. So mm-hmm. essentially, the bigger the trip, the bigger the um, reported benefits of psychedelics, mm-hmm. um, which is very interesting that those two are tightly correlated. Yeah. Um, could, could it be that it's the trip that is helping or at, in, in part helping with the actual uh, therapeutic benefits possibly. Um, but that's something that we were still trying to figure out in science. There's a, there's been a lot of research this year that actually, you know, brings that point back to us where we, at first we thought that there was something called uh, TRKB, which is a receptor that, we see is active also when a person does psychedelics. And we believe for a bit of time that perhaps that is responsible for a person's beneficial, um, the beneficial, the beneficial uh, properties of psychedelics. But then of course a paper came out like a few weeks um, later that sort of um, refuted, not refuted, but gave us <clears throat> different evidence that shows that perhaps it is the trip that yeah. is are responsible for the therapeutic benefits of psychedelics. So wow. why are these companies or pharmaceuticals or whoever's trying to Patents. develop this? Is it because Probably what? what's money. the point of taking the psychedelic trip out of it? Easier manage. So the theory is that if you can take, so, okay, the theory with, not the theory, but the, the belief of people in the FDA is that the idea of a trip is a sort of counterintuitive maladaptive side effect of a drug. Um, and oh that's, yeah, I know that's taken from really someone that's they, never they, tripped. Clearly. Coffee's too yeah. hot. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so, so apparently, um, these companies that have been forming believe that if they could, if they could take the trip out of psychedelics, that it would get past the yeah. FDA quicker and they could go to rush through phase one, phase two, phase three, and then of course get it, get first, whatever first to market psychedelic X thing. Yeah. First to market, which is super important um, to make a lot of cash. But mm-hmm. the thing about these companies, and there's tons of companies that are forming, trying to build their own um, analogs of psych of, you know, yeah. existing psychedelics. The problem with this sort of pursuit is that, Guess what? It takes a bunch of cash to push forth a drug into the country. It's not an easy process. It mm. takes a lot of money. And most companies, which we've seen in psychedelics, they can't really get past the first phase. They Perhaps they can't even get to the first phase because it takes so much cash, so much research to put forth a drug. So lots of companies that have already been formed, have already collapsed. And there's only one company, only one company that has successfully done that, basically built an entire psychedelic from phase one to, you know, your um, local pharmaceutical, uh, whatever. And it's Johnson and Johnson. Mm-hmm. I mean, Johnson and Johnson has Johnson and Johnson cash. Like, yeah. That isn't a problem, you know. Yeah. And they uh, they actually presented uh, S ketamine, which is a um, an antimer of uh, ketamine, to the market, and they it's called uh, Spravato, which is like a little spray that you sort of spray in your mouth and you get a hit of ketamine. They have that. They did that. It's you can get it right now if you have the prescription. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I know several people that are using ketamine for depression, and it, it it's literally curing them. 
think uh, Musk takes ketamine. Yeah, a lot of people. What else talked about it? I mean, I just I don't know a lot about ketamine at all. I've just I've always well, heard the 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 branded terms for it and what have you, but never it's got a lot of misnomers. Never really, yeah, never and, really and met it's, anybody. It's that's, also becoming one of the most uh, abused drugs in the festival scene. Yeah, I don't I know mean, what it even does. You know, we work uh, Lost Lands Festival, which is a headbanger EDM, EDM run by Excision uh, out here in Ohio, and uh, I mean, just the the ketamine use is unbelievable. It's not like when we were going to shows back in our 20s, like people weren't just blasting ketamine in the middle of a concert. I was shocked. I've never even seen it. No. And it's it's pretty prevalent in in some scenes, which is it's like, dude, why would you want to be in that state of mind right now? And like with 50,000 people everywhere. I don't know. Well, what is the what's going on when you take it, Zeus? What? Yeah, so I was going to bring up ketamine. It's it's really interesting. It's 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 a it's a very sort of interesting psychedelic because all other psychedelics they affect serotonin receptors. They're ser they're serotonin um, activators, yeah. agonists. They essentially activate serotonin receptors, uh, and that's LSD, DMT, MDMA. They all work with serotonin, but ketamine is different. It's an NMDA antagonist. So NMDA are receptors, and it, it the sort of um, activation happens with deactivation. So it actually blocks receptors to get that psychedelic effect. It, it blocks NMDA receptors. So that's the only psychedelic that we have that's an NMDA antagonist. But there is another one that works just as well as ketamine, and it's called PCP. Mm, angel dust really pc yeah angel dust is basically ketamine it's it's mm. essentially ketamine it, it's just a sort of it's it's also an nmda antagonist it appears to have the same therapeutic benefits of ketamine it functionally it, it appears that it like works the same as ketamine but the problem with pcp is that it's pcp it has <laughs> a very cultural baggage yeah. of people you know um, saying things like this is like football on PCP, you know, it's, it's just, it's so instilled in our um, sure. cultural uh, dogma that, that it's going to be difficult for PCP to sort of come to the forefront as a potentially yeah. therapeutic substance. But Do we need to go like UFO, paper, UAP, PCP, P, PCP. It, it, re- it needs it, rebranded. Just, it needs rebranded. rebranded a little bit. Well, mm. And even for me, I'm open-minded when it comes to all these things, but I hear PCP and I think of naked guy in an emergency room. <laughs> <laughs> screaming, freaking out, you know, that's exactly what comes to my mind. I'm just being honest. Jeez. If, and like I said, <laughs> if you're telling me it's got therapeutic benefits, I can't wipe that from my brain. All I've I, seen so many videos of people losing. I mean, I can you know, think of mushrooms. You ever think seen of uh, Father John Misty going down to Big Sur and getting naked and up in a tree and giving away all of his possessions <laughs> and quitting the Fleet Foxes and inventing Father John Misty. Yeah. That's how he became wow. that artist. Like he was yeah. the drummer for the Fleet Foxes. He was didn't know what to do with his life. He was kind of despondent about his position. Goes down to Big Sur, eats a heavy dose, maybe a heroic dose. Tells his buddy, "I'm going to name myself Father John Misty." And his friend was like, "Please don't do that." <laughs> and he did it anyways. <laughs> it you know, and just he keeps at it. But yeah, like sometimes it it appears very like unsavory. I think is what you're saying. Yeah, it's, like, it's hard to wipe that mental image of the gentleman in the. ER bay yeah. with no clothes on. I don't know where you got that image, but I've seen uh, videos. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's a video called uh, that Steve-O released back in the early 2000s when Steve-O okay. was still partying a lot. Yeah, and it's it's an underground VHS tape that uh, you know they used to do, do those skateboard videos, right? Like Bam and all those mm-hmm. guys. And that company made this. It, it's called PCP Saved My Life, and it oh. might be on the internet, but it's Steve-O. Flipping out on PCP, and after that experience, he kind of got his stuff together, yeah. got off drugs for a while, had these realizations. But the video of St- of Stevo in that state is just like ridiculous, hard to handle. Yeah, it's just a wild like for I've, whatever reason people just I have a question they, they wild the, out and and MDMA. What is N MDMA? So you're talking about that's what gets blocked, and so instead of being an agonist that creates the it's blocking it to create it instead of turning it on to create it right like you're turning off the light switch and you're getting light basically is what you're saying yeah so nmda is essentially it's this thing called a coincidence detector 
Um, it sounds pretty wild, but that's what they call it in science. And uh, a coincidence detector receptor is... So with almost all receptors, you have, they're all sort of um, chemically um, gated receptors. So mm -hmm. a, a chemical comes in, serotonin, hits it, opens it up, boom. That's how most receptors right. operate, you know? Right. Um, and then, of course, it goes deeper with uh, calcium and all the but, like, but So an NMDA uh, receptor is a coincidence detector, which basically entails that it, if, let's say the correct chemical compound arrived at the actual receptor itself, it still wouldn't actually open up. It opens up with a combination of chemicals and electricity. So the what? electricity has to, yeah, the, the uh, voltage has to be correct and the chemical compound has to be correct for these, for this NMDA receptor to open up. But an NMDA antagonist like ketamine says, okay, let's say, for example, it, the voltage in the receptor is correct and the uh, chemical compound is actually correct for it to open up. Ketamine actually prevents it from actually opening up. Hmm. So that in that prevention, you get the experience of a psychedelic trip. And of course, there's increases of glutamate. There's uh, other sort of things happening with these receptors. But by it preventing the receptor from opening up increases or essentially starts the psychedelic feeling or the subjective experience of ketamine. Oh, wow. That leads me to think of the matrix. And if we're shutting that down all the time, like maybe it's revealing reality. Like right now it's so, actually, you got, you got the hallucination is the reality we're seeing from those receptors being open at the moment. And when we close them, you see what's not being generated. Well, I don't know. I, maybe I that's a that, stretch, uh, but there's a great documentary called neurons to Nirvana. If anybody's ever mm -hmm. seen that, uh, that's Dennis McKenna's in it. Mm -hmm. uh, all the big – this is you know probably like six, seven years ago that came out. But Dennis McKenna talks about the frontal lobe, uh, the cortex, and how essentially they found out that it literally just shuts down when you take a big dose of mushrooms or mm -hmm. DMT. And it actually allowed – that's what – and Zeus, you could probably explain this better, but from what I understand, it, it shuts off your perception, your brain's perception of reality. And so when that kind of gets shut off, you're able to see what is true reality, like what you right. were just saying. That's what I'm saying. In a weird way, yes, 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 yes. It's a, Sorry, go ahead. It's exact, yes, opposite of that in the same way. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um I love Dennis McKenna, but that's not correct. No, um, and I, I no, but I love him. I love him. I love his brother. They've done amazing things, but uh, that's not quite correct. Okay. And perhaps that's the reason why they believe that is because the research wasn't at the point where they. Yeah, this is a while where back. We had it. Yeah, so so that that's perfect. But he is onto something in, in this in the sense that the prefrontal cortex, which is like right here in the front of the head, um, it does some very interesting things. So, for example, this area of your brain right here, the pre, the um, right here, prefrontal cortex, it's saturated with serotonin receptors, like packed, packed. And what we found, not what we, but like scientists overall, very recently, this happened in 2021, there was a scientist named Ling Zing Xiao. She came from Yale. Uh, she was under a fantastic lab. And she discovered that when a person or when a, when yeah, when a person does psychedelics, it could be psilocybin or LSD. That's what she looked at. First off, let me go back to what happens before you take psychedelics. So let's say you like wake up and you have a bad day. You know, you fall like, you know, you hit your head on the bed. You stub your toe. You're, you're like stressing out about work. There's all, you know, all this sort of daily sort of crap that a person goes through. What what we found is that there's cells in the right here, the um, frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex that essentially um, atrophies and atrophy in the sense that it gets like weak. Uh, certain cells in the cortex gets very, very weak and it just happens. It's, it's a process. It's sort of a result of like just daily like wear and tear, man, just just like stress, depression, anxiety, just, 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 just crap that you deal with every single day. And it happens to everybody, right? But what she found is that when psychedelics are actually introduced to 
the body that those cells that actually atrophy, they immediately restructure, strengthen, and grow immediately. Hmm. Not within like, you know, uh, weeks or days. No, within seconds. So to doing, the point where she actually... Doing psychedelics yeah, is like a happiness workout. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're strengthening I, I that ability you, for you serotonin could, reception or... Yeah, you could you could probably say that. Um you you can say that, but there's I think there are some exceptions though. So uh so for example, she even got those cells and put them in a petri dish just by themselves and she just dropped LSD and psilocybin just without the brain attached and she found that those those very interesting cells just instantly rebuilt, restructured. Wow, wow. Instantly. instantly. So and then a unreal but the cool thing about that is that when this process happens it stays sort of re you know I'm sort of built back better for a pretty long time days weeks after the first dose of uh, psychedelics it has this this super persistent effect of of keeping these cells you know re rebuilt and and you know you know very very strong and 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 everything so that is a, that's something that we just discovered in 2021. So wow, wow. science, yeah, science is definitely going pretty fast. Unbelievable. What do you think are the most important research that's happening right now in the world? I know Johns Hopkins, and there's some uh, in the UK. There's a lot of universities that are, are yeah, doing I'm not studies. Real familiar with the scene. It's hard to keep up because now there's so many studies. Uh, you know, and I know your studies, what you're doing is very important, but overall, are there any that stick out to you that our listeners should, if they're interested in this stuff, should go look into? Yeah, man. I think what we're doing out here in Master University is pretty extraordinary. Uh, so, for example, we're running this one study where we're, we're actually finding people that are um, in like relationships, like um, couples, basically, and we're giving them LSD. And we're doing this thing called a hyper brain scan. Mm -hmm. So essentially, we're taking both of their brains, we're hooking it up to EEG, and then we're basically taking that and connecting it to like one computer source to like see any synchronizations of activity sure. while they're taking LSD. Mm. And, and I can't tell you what we're finding, but we're finding stuff. <laughs> nice. Man. To the point where I'm telling you, that I think what we're doing is pretty interesting, but I can't tell you what it is. I can't tell you what we're actually finding, but the paper's going to come out maybe in, I don't know, next year, sometime next year, but it's going to blow people's heads off for sure. Stay tuned, everybody. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> I hate to say it, Zeus, but you might have a, uh, unless you block me on Twitter, I'm going to keep talking to you probably for a long time. Like, man, I'm going to need to know what's going on. And, and my thing is, is one thing I want to get better as connecting with folks like you is, is I always kind of hear about the studies after it's over. Right. You know what I mean? Like you see an article in the New York times might talk about it. It's like, you know, new mushroom study found this, this, and this. Yeah. I'm trying to get to like, while these studies are happening and, and talking to the mm. people that are on the inside, like yourself and kind of being more up to date in, in what's happening. Yeah, man, there's some really dope things happening. Actually last week, uh, my friend Katrin Preeler at the university of Zurich, uh, she just published a really, really dope paper where she actually looked at the idea of people on like shrooms and then compared to people that are like yoga instructors people mm -hmm. that are like master meditators and all this all these different sort of brain states that you like you know mm -hmm. see and you hear and she discovered that while you know things like yoga meditation is very important the brain state of psychedelics is incomparable like the activity is incomparable compared to like meditation like they aren't the same you can't get to the same places what um, LSD takes you compared to what like meditation takes you. Can I ask you something hmm. to that to follow up Ram Das in a book I yes. read many years ago? I think uh, the only dancer is his his take on that was he was in India, met his guru. The gentleman kept saying, give me some of that medicine you brought. And he's like, what? And so he's giving him hits of acid and he ends up giving this, you know, guru like 
three or four hits of acid and Ram Dass is just like, holy cow, like this guy should be on the floor and capacitated. And the, the guy was basically like, look, this is how I always am. Like this isn't doing anything to me. So then Ram Dass was like, he, he was like, that's Yogi when I medicine. hung up the phone of, of uh, psychedelics. Like I got the message and I hung up the phone and it's interesting to hear you say that because that gentleman was obviously doing a lot of work with Leary back in his time when they were teaching together and started getting into the psychedelic research they were doing. So how do you explain him having that perspective and then going into more of a meditative pursuit of it? Do you, would you say you truly believe he never had another experience like he did with psychedelics after he went to meditation and left the psychedelics off the table? Yeah, man. Ram Dass has a very interesting journal or I'm um, not a journal journey. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, he was a professor at Harvard and then he left, he left Harvard and, and he became Ram Dass after traveling through India and all this stuff. So I don't know, man, I, I have his book right here in my bookshelf, be here, uh, whatever it's called, mm-hmm. but, um, mm-hmm. be here now. Yeah, man. I, I don't know how I feel about Ram Dass. I, I think, um, think i don't know man it's it's such a touchy subject well no and i have no real feeling on it one way or the other i'm just trying to get to i can understand because after reading the the paper on the priests given the psilocybin and the one gentleman going obviously i've never had another experience like that and i could never really contextualize like what i felt as the spirit as a pastor or, or priest but that one instance was night and day different. And that's why I think did Ram Das when he got into the meditative portion, he had enough to carry over from his experiences in psychedelics to almost blend the two together somehow. Well, he always admits that psychedelics were a huge part of his path. But, you know, that's what I'm saying, though. I don't I, I kind of agree with Zeus on this. And the research is showing it from what he's saying that no matter how much you meditate or this or that, like you're not going to get there the same way with taking a five gram dose of psilocybin or two tabs of LSD of some high strength. You know what I mean? Like that's, what's really altering your state. You can try to be peppy, but that cup of coffee with the caffeine will give you that. But you could use yoga and meditation to help integrate your experience on a big trip. I get that. I get that. So I I, I don't know. I think it goes hand in hand. I'm just taking, I'm just taking the experiences of saying I can get to the same reality status. No, I know you're meditating or yoga as I can with this. And I don't think you can, you can prepare yourself for that trip, but yeah, I mean, unless if you take DMT, it's really, you want to get to the moon, you need a rocket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you can't wish it. Yeah. I don't think yoga can get you there. Like Kundalini yoga, according Kundalini. to, according to uh, VJ, yeah. you know, VJ says that you can get into some pretty yeah. high level spaces doing that. But Zeus, how did you, and it is with the perception portion of the study, I assume, but VR and yeah, DMT, let's, let's talk like, about how that does bit. that go? <clears throat> Yeah, man. So um, VR is interesting, man. It's it's really it's, it's so it's so it's so interesting in the sense that for a very long time VR was just sort of stuck. It was sort of yep. stagnated, and and, mm-hmm. and the tech wasn't really advancing. This is I'm talking about back in the day when you had these films that depicted like a cyberpunk future with VR, and yeah. they had these giant headsets on and all this stuff. But we really didn't get anywhere with VR because we were using this sort of the same law of tech and then we then this one kid lucky palmer uh he was like 19 years old and he invented uh the um, first uh oculus rift in his like garage 19 years old this guy from san diego and he essentially redefined the entire vr field that's incredible yeah of course he sold his company to uh facebook for like i think somewhere like a billion plus dollars maybe and he's um and I was just showing. So, so since, so thanks to him, uh, we have a VR field again, and we can do some fantastic things. So, what am I doing with VR and DMT? So, the thing about VR is that, like, the biggest problem with VR is that almost every single headset you put it on, and then you have this sort of thing in the back where you like strap it on and you sort of tighten it up, and then you have it on your head. Right? That's how most VR headsets work. The problem with that is that if you're trying to research the brain, specifically the visual cortex, which is 
actually in the back of the head, mm-hmm. you can't really do that because there's a giant thing going around the visual cortex. So really I had to, we, we planned on building this sort of headset that was strapped on, and, but then we had to wait because the, because we tried building stuff and it didn't really work out. So then we had to wait for this uh, company called HTC to come out with this thing called the HTC XR Elite headset. And what that is, it's a VR headset that just goes on like glasses. What? So you don't have this sort of back. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I, I was in it uh, today. Wow. It's beautiful. It's it just it goes on like glasses, and wow. it like leaves this entire back area for you know research. So finally, and I mean we're, I mean like yeah, it's it's something that is so groundbreaking that it just came out like two and a half months ago. The actual tech, so that we can even do this research. I think I saw a photo um, of you on your Twitter wearing the glasses in the lab. And yeah, I was like, oh yeah, my man. gosh, that would be so interesting to see what's <laughs> happening right now. Wow. It's yeah. And, and, and so yeah, so that is a headset that we're using. We're also using this uh this um imaging device called functional infrared spectroscopy, functional near infrared spectroscopy, which is a way to look at the brain and brain activity by using photons of light. Yes. It's what? called optodes. And yeah, it's, it's so I'll tell you a little bit how, how it works. So essentially you put on this cap and these caps are filled with these things called optodes and optodes are just like little phaser guns that shoot little photons of light in your head or on your uh, brain. Basically. Would this be similar and to like phaser- a pulse oximeter that you put on your finger with the little red light, getting your blood oxygen kind of along that vein of penetrating just so deep through the skin or into the actual like through bone sorry to get i just no 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 you you know you're 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 basically right that so it it so it um it's functional near infrared so it penetrates the skin and it, we can get the brain we can't go deep in the brain with right, this right. technology but, but we can get the cortical layers like visual cortex auditory okay. cortex motor cortex, which are, which is how we sort of experience our, you know, reality, Mm -hmm. auditory, visual, all this stuff. So the way it does it is that it shoots little photons of light on your brain. And based on if the blood in your brain has oxygen, or if it doesn't have oxygen, it will bounce back differently. So you can see the activity based on how it bounces off the actual blood yes. in your brain that's so crazy and that's wow i think that's how the pulse oximeter works and they've put it on a bigger scale and figured out like hey we because again it's kind of like putting somebody in a pet scan and going well we want to see where the sugar is going to see where the tumors are right they're the ones taking up the nutrients the oxygen is showing it needs that resource right to actually light up and consume it so anything devoid of oxygenated blood is obviously not getting the hierarchical concern of the body at that moment right yeah, yeah, you hit it on the head. Yeah. So um the way so our brain is constantly shifting between oxygen, deoxygenated blood. Constantly. It's a process that is just ever present, ever present in our brains. Some areas are like more active than others, depending on what we're doing. Uh, but while we're on psychedelics, we see that these sort of areas of the brain that have been sort of segregated, like for example, the prefrontal cortex and the visual cortex or the uh, DMN and all these different areas before they're sort of, you know, in their own little areas, the activity is just sort of in their own little areas. But after we take, you know, any sort of substance like LSD or uh, psilocybin, these areas have less sort of less segregation, less structure, and they sort of blend together. They mix together the, the actual activity mixed together, mixes together. So now all of this sort of energy that was that sort of resided to keep these areas integral to keep these areas focused and sort of structured that energy sort of disperses out in the brain hmm. and it allows these areas to talk to other areas it really doesn't talk to and that is basically when you're tripping when that happens you're definitely tripping wow but i've heard that as well in a lot of times is is why people go oh, well that how did you do this or i've never 
painted before or I did something like, you know, just opening up those areas. And it, again, I draw analogies. That's how my brain works. It makes me think of the Sphinx and Robert Schock, right? He's not an archaeologist, but he's a geologist. And it's a blending of concerns to where he looks at the situation different. He's looking at the erosion of the Sphinx, not the archaeological part of it, right? So in this instance, you have your brain going, hey, uh, prefrontal cortex and, you know, motor back here or whatever, you know, doesn't normally talk. You guys get together today and hash it out and share ideas. And then you get people going, I could, you know, see music or I could hear colors or whatever kind of off the wall thing that it usually ties back to the blending of those senses. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, synesthesia is mm -hmm. what you're uh, referring to. And that's the, that's the sort of you know, um, concept of you can like, um, hear taste or you could taste sound or you could feel a uh, vision or something where all of these sensory modalities get a little bit mixed up and really i mean it happens quite often when you do psychedelics some people really don't like recognize it but for example the next time you do lsd or shrooms and you're listening to like i don't know led zeppelin or something or whatever you want to listen to just close your eyes just close your eyes and if you see anything visual that is in sync with the actual sound oh god my friend you're having <laughs> synesthesia yeah yeah CEV, well, I have those eye visuals. I have natural synesthesia, but I don't have it in that aspect. And it's kind of a weirder one where letters and numbers have a, a have always had a gender to me since I was like in kindergarten. My wife what? thought that I like was taught it this way or something. I was like, no, like I just this is how my it was just one of those things until I let it out of my brain that that's how it worked. I didn't know that mm -hmm. that was abstract. And the first mm -hmm. time that she was like, that's strange. And then I read a book uh, by a neuropsychologist, uh, I think it's Daniel Eagleman or something. It was called Incognito, The Secret Life of the Mind, and kind of how we are the awareness passenger of the Titanic that we're riding on. But did I drink the water because I'm thirsty or because my body said I needed it? All these conflicts of, you know, what was the decision-making process of how you made a decision and how some of those underpinnings are really tied to deeper uh, structures that we're not aware of why we make certain choices even, right? But... um he had a section in it of, yeah, he starts talking about, yeah, certain people see letters and numbers with like a color to them or a, I was like, wait, what? Like that is so bizarre to me because it just seemed like a natural thought. So that's interesting that you say that if you take a psychedelic and you listen to the music with your eyes closed and see in sync visions with the music, you're having a that's synesthesia. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, I think you actually brought up the idea of psychedelics. Uh, you were saying something uh, very interesting. I forgot what it was, uh, but it made me think about the idea of psychedelics enhancing creativity. You know, you mm -hmm. always hear that. Sure. You always hear people sure. like the Beatles, they took like LSD and they made mm -hmm. all these albums. And of course, Steve Jobs, he took LSD and then Apple happened and everything. Yeah. And, and of course, Jimi Hendrix, all these sort of brilliant artists brilliant inventors taking LSD and coming, you know, making these brilliantly creative things. And is there any truth to that? Like, do we have any actual evidence that shows psychedelics actually enhances creativity? And we, so we are here. Uh, we actually have researched that we have researched psychedelics and creativity, oh, wow. which is the reason why. Yeah. Like we are, we're doing stuff that people aren't doing here. This is amazing. Mexico. That's so cool. Yeah. So we did this. Uh, Kim Coopers did this. She was the uh, lead researcher. And she found that psychedelics does this thing called increased divergent thinking. And what is that? So let's say if I give you a paperclip. And a paperclip is for sort of, you know, keeping papers clip. That's what it's built for, right? But divergent thinking is like, okay, I give you a paperclip. Now tell me how else you can... Um, you know, do something with this clip. Can you make it into a, a boomerang? Can you make it into a slingshot? Can you make it into a little person? Can you make it into whatever? I see That's divergent going. thinking. You take like one thing and you find, you know, multiple purposes for it. But we had this uh, research where we gave people, I believe, psilocybin, and then we had them sort of assess their own um, convergent thinking, which is sort of the base, you know, paperclip paper and divergent thinking, which is like paperclip and slingshot or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know? And we found that Yes, psychedelics appears to increase divergent thinking. So mm -hmm. we take things that are sort of ordinary 
and we construct things that we wouldn't necessarily do with these things. Mm-hmm. That right. happens with psychedelics. Well, and to your point with the creatives like Hendrix, like the Beatles, whoever was dabbling in those psychedelics and well, having even that, the guy that you're came up with pushing the, the limits, the helix, the double yeah. helix of DNA. Yeah. He envisioned that on an LSD trip. But I think those type of people, those creative minds, they are already the divergent thinkers already is what you're saying. Sure. And when they take it. Yeah. And then it's. Then it's like. World changing. It's great for anyone to have that art. ability. Yeah. But they're already at a level of like, okay, let's take Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's already a big dude. He took, I mean, openly admits that he took steroids when he was doing, you know, Mr. Universe and this and that. And obviously. But. It pushed him to the point he could be that, like, I can't be Arnold Schwarzenegger no matter how many steroids I take, right? I'm not going to be Paul McCartney or John Lennon no matter how many uh, mushroom like, trips I take or something, right? But yeah. it's that level of, like, because you think about it, because I like to think that I have a fairly active mind, and I'm always surprised when I can have what I would consider an original thought. This is very hard to. It's very difficult to have a really original thought. Like, I usually Google to see if it's an original thought. Like, nope, somebody ever made it. Somebody ever thought it, you know. So when you get to that level where you need to go to that next level for those artists, I would say it probably felt very familiar to them in a way because even me writing music, I've told them before, like, how'd you write this song? I have no idea. I just heard it before I ever even played it. Yeah, I mean, in Harvard, like it was there the early Harvard studies? Those guys were given all the other scientists at the university doses of psilocybin and LSD. Oh, really? And they were taking it and having these essentially like meetings every Monday night, where they would just brainstorm. Oh, at the house and the stuff that would come out of these group uh, trips with these scientists. I mean, they were on the cutting edge of coming up with uh, unbelievable new technologies and. and now he's and, in a lab doing it. Yeah. And that was just kind of <laughs> antiquated, you know, let's give them this. Yeah. How much were they actually, what kind of data were, were they hooking? They weren't hooking them up to machines. It I was think it kinda, was just subjective from the, yeah. the the experiencer was coming back and saying, this is what I experienced or and et cetera. Is, yeah. But and they would report back. Now getting to hard data and using these fMRI scans and using the uh, pulsating, you know, brain scan that you're using with the VR. F-nurse. There we go. Thank F-nurse. you. Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, where do you see, and not, I, I don't want, I, you probably can't give away too much yet because you guys are still working on it. What, what would be some of the most surprising things that you found that you could even touch on? Like something yeah. that you went, wow, I really did not even expect that. Like, is there anything you can kind of give us a small one? Yeah, man, you know, it's... <laughs> So this past Saturday, I was at a party in Rotterdam with Mm -hmm. a few other scientists, and uh, they kind of joked saying that our lab is the most secretive lab on the planet. Uh, We (laughs) and everyone tries to sort of pry into our like lab, and we it's where we have this sort of fortress that we you know construct, I guess. Yeah, and And I understand it if you can't tell us anything. That's totally fine. I I mean, I I I could no, I could yeah, no, it's it's. There's a lot. Yeah, I, I can't tell you a lot, but I can tell you a little bit. Um, uh, so, OK, what's the question? I, I'll, I'll see if I could. So I'll going I could say, so say going into it, you've obviously done some research. Yeah. You've had some experiences. Yeah. You have an idea of what maybe you think are your, your pre prepositions and what do you think is going to happen? And I'm saying more of say from even an experiencer of having a more profound experience than you've ever heard or something like that. Yeah, um, just the, something that's an outlier. Does the VR okay. add to it in some way? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. So what I can say is that, um, so, okay. So in the beginning of the VR experiment, I, I of course, had to do lots of research mm-hmm. just on, perception on how perception works on how vr works on how you know psychedelics affects perception and it was a journey that took me a long time very long time months and in this journey i had an idea and i was going forth towards a certain idea and something else presented itself to me that i was shocked that someone didn't find this or didn't discover this. Mm. I was so shocked that I actually went back for decades, decades reading papers wow. to see 
if anyone else discovered this, if anyone else put this together. And I believe that the, a paper that's going to be coming out very soon is going to introduce a theory to how we experience psychedelic trips that hasn't been presented before. And this is the precursor for why we're incorporating VR into psychedelic research. Oh, cool. Very cool. Awesome. I, th I yeah. think I can understand what you're hitting on a little bit just because of, I'll, I'll take it my, my, my vision on it. You go see Pink Floyd. You go see any of those <laughs> concerts back in the day. You go to a good concert now of somebody that really gives you an experience of sound quality and the experience of the concert, but also they do this show, right? Like it's not just about the audible, like it, the visual helps enhance that so much. Right. The laser right? show, and the so light show. Making it memorable, sound, making yeah. it a transcendent experience, like whatever it a is. A Tame Impala concert. Tame Impala is very well known for having heavy visuals because that, to me, is... I always say you can be a musician who's really good at music and terrible at a show. You can be a musician who's really good at a show and terrible at music. Or you can be those rare, rare instances where they get what they're doing and they take you along for almost like a guided concert, right? Like... Everything's thought out. They think of like Woodstock or those, not that those were heavy on visuals, but those big shared experience moments where you have these massive crowds and you can almost kind of do this. I don't know. I, I call it like hypnotism almost like why I went to the gizzard concert. That was so much fun. And everybody there was just in this vibe that I can't explain. And the makeup of the crowd didn't even make sense to me of how everybody was, you know, but that's the whole thing. Everybody was yeah. on the same vibrational frequency that's through what point. was happening. Zeus, have you got has anybody ever considered researching psychedelics at music festivals? Because that's kind of our background. We shoot used to shoot a ton of concerts and shows, and even before that, we went to uh, you know tons of shows and, and and festivals over the years. Seen a lot and of music. It's the culture there of of psychedelic use, and uh, you know you have people now. You have uh, Places that have, um, you know, places where if you're having a bad trip, you can go to, which back in the day right. didn't exist. Yeah. So I don't know if there's anybody, if it's worth looking into of, you know, that four day weekend of like researching a group of people as they kind of, because the first night, you're not the same person as the last day. There's like this on this bloom, this onion bloom that mm. happens when you go to these shows. And, uh, you know, it's whether it's the way that you're you're dressed when you get there and then by by Saturday night, you're definitely, you know, you got yeah. glow sticks hanging off you. You yeah. got some chick's scarf that you got on Friday <laughs> night that you're wearing now or, you know, what I mean, like it just you you, you found a LED hat yeah. or whatever it is. But that's what I'm thinking of when you're using uh, and, and not only not just a visual stimuli, we're using VR. Right. So we're just you're already changing the reality and then changing the reality it makes me think of inception of like going down multiple dream levels you know what i mean of now we're going into multiple alternate states right at once like that's so wild now the more i think about it i totally understand what you're doing in a certain way i don't fully get it but i, I like it well thank you yeah so uh yeah well okay well think about it like like this you know um, you've done DM. I mean, I'm not sure if you have done DMT. No, I'm I saying people. No, people out there have done DMT. Right. And the thing about DMT is that when you do DMT, it's so intriguing in the sense that your eyes can be open or closed. Well, it doesn't really matter. Right. Your entire visual perception. Yep. Is Just taken over, over. Yeah. Almost like pharmacological virtual reality yeah that's really interesting mm -hmm. totally makes so sense. with so with that i guess if that's what happens when you take that how if it doesn't matter what your optic nerve is taking in as a stimuli because that's not what's being rendered on the screen of your mind then why wear vr goggles what is the vr yeah. doing visually to help affect does it i get again i'm what I'm wondering is, does it have any effect? Like, there's got to be ways to measure that. Like, we're going to change the scene to this. Does it actually affect it? Because they're visually getting a stimulus, even though they're not saying back that they're seeing the vision. Yeah. 
but also keep in mind while this is happening, we're also looking at their brain. We're looking at the brain sure, activity sure. with increased temporal precision. We could see the exact time, the exact areas of things that happen wow. in the brain. So that's yeah. And this I, I is can't, I can't no that yeah. that's that's great. That uh and the other question would be I now think I understand why the administration is the way it is, right? Of the uh DMT itself. If you give it in a typical fashion, it's going to be an experience you can't really capture lightning in a bottle in that 15, 20 minute window. So it's like we're gonna need this for like a four hour study or three hour window, or we need this much recorded data. So the administration, cause even when, I, I don't know if it was Strassman or Doblin who was doing it out West when he was doing slow drip DMT administration. That's recent. Was just blowing my mind. But with this, it makes a lot of sense of what you're trying to capture too. In, I hate to say it, but in data, you gotta get that data to make the correlations and to find out what's going on. Yeah. So uh, what you just said, uh, there, there's a fantastic scientist, uh, Chris Timmerman from Imperial College London, and he's focused on the idea of extended state DMT trips. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what we're talking and, about. Yeah. And what that is, is a person, they take DMT and then they sort of have this, you know, quote unquote drip that extends the state of DMT. And uh, what they found is that in order for a person to have an actual extended state DMT experience, you have to have this thing called a bolus uh, injection of DMT or a bolus dose of DMT. Now, what is a bolus dose? It means that yeah. in the beginning, you have to take a bunch of it, yeah. a lot of it, like a huge hit. And then if that hit is big enough, then you can extend it with a little yeah. bit of DMT. But if that hit isn't big enough, then it's just going to fade away and you won't be able to extend that state of DMT. Mm -hmm. So is that like a weight-based calculation, I would assume, of mics to kilogram or something of, hey, you come in and you weigh 100, you know, you're going to get this many micrograms or milligrams or grams of whatever. I don't know how you're dosing out the DMT in, in that fashion, but is that accurate? It's a yeah, weight-based so measure or is it everybody gets a standard? Here's your... Yeah, so there's, there's there's this fantastic scientist, Matthias Lecti, at the University of Basel, and he actually researched this. He researched if, in fact, we have to do a weight-based uh, dosage sure. or like a um, female, uh, sure. you know, and, 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 and he discovered that in actuality, weight really doesn't make a difference when it comes to okay. a psychedelic trip, which is pretty interesting. Like, and, and, and if it did, it's very, very, very slight, almost statistically insignificant when it comes to weight. Okay. Uh, but he did, which is interesting, but he did find that there's a small, 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 small difference between the um, administration of psychedelics between a man and a woman, just a very, very small amount, but not okay. that. In, in whose favor, who's negative? Or who's benefit or who's um, detriment, I guess, would you say? Who needs to take to more so to get to the point? You, you would require less psychedelics for women to act to have a sort of the same subjective experience as a guy. As okay. A, okay. So it's interesting. Yeah. Did not know that. But 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 not by a lot. Like it's it's not that important. It's pretty insignificant that it's not like yeah. you have to you know, they wouldn't be like, Oh, here's your five grams and here's your four point nine right. nine 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 nine, so, nine nine grams. It's so insignificant that we don't do sort of any sort of different comparison when it comes gotcha. to a male or female. They all get the same well, and that's also kind of some interesting work just there, right? Like most drugs, weren't they basically tested on men back in the day? And here's your heart medication women, and it's only been tried on men. We didn't do a dosage yeah. calc. We didn't do a weight base. We didn't check all the hormones or how they that think that's how they used to do a lot of pharmacology studies. It was like, well, oh, we just tested, gosh. you know, the average 35 year old male and he did fine. So everybody should be good. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> dude, it was the worst, man. Pharmacology in like the 50s and the 60s, it was even the 70s. It was so it was so centered around the idea that women are chemically imbalanced. Therefore, in order for them to be, quote unquote, balanced, they have to take things like benzos or all right. these different sort of uh, right. drugs. Yeah. And you can actually find um, ads from the 60s where it's like, you know, wife is acting up. We'll give her some benzos. This will uh, <laughs> calm her down. Good and Lord. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's so it's pretty wild, man. Almost all pharmacology from that time was to sort of feed this sort of, you know, very 
dumb and incorrect idea that women are somehow chemically imbalanced. Of course, that's all BS. Right. It is not correct at all. Right. All people need to realize that that's just BS. But pharmacology has its very weird sort of past and weird history. And yeah. And uh, hopefully we can yeah. get that fixed. I mean, Ritalin was originally invented for like pet pills for housewives in the 50s or something like that. Oh, and yeah. And it was repackaged as ADHD medication. Vacuuming the house very uh, yeah, very expediently and, you know, keeping everything nice and orderly. Man. Um, so we've come a long way, man. And, and really, Zeus, the last three, four years, I feel like the research in the last 30 years, we've gotten more information in the last three or four than the previous 30. Is that true? Man, you're absolutely right, man. So uh, I would say that, like, this, there's a guy named Robin Carhart Harris. He was a professor at a Imperial College of London, and he um, he had, like recently moved to the University of California, San Francisco. But he's like the first guy, or like one of the first people, but definitely the most significant person to take the idea of giving people psychedelics and fMRI, which is a way to um, look at the brain de- like very uh, deeply. You know, he was the first person to really do that. And fMRI research has tremendously shown us a lot about how the brain operates when a person is under psychedelics. So Robert Card Harris, and he did his first study around 2000, think 13, 14, something like that. So it's, yeah, it's been about 10 years, but the past like five years, I would say has been tremendous. And I, I, it's going to sound bad, but one of the reasons why psychedelic science has sort of like astronomically passed other science or, you know, sort of progressed so quickly is because of COVID. Yeah. You had all these like scientists that were like locked in their homes with all these like giant, um, you know, sets of um, information and like data with yeah. really um, nothing else to do. So they just crunched all of this data. Wow. And we there's so many papers that just came out based on the fact that we actually had time to do the research. Right. <laughs> all right. All right. For the tally board of COVID, what have you done good for me and what have you done bad for me? That is I mean, the first time I'm going to put one in the positive <laughs> Check box. Well, this podcast. <laughs> well, okay, two. We got two now. <laughs> we started this show in well, April of 2020, Zeus, because we lost wow. all the concerts, the conferences, all our work went away. Yeah. Like you, you shifted well, gears. Yeah. We have a similar story. Yeah. Well, we've told it on the show. It also made me want to quit but, my job, so I quit my job. So I'll put that as the third positive of COVID. But yeah. Oh wow. <clears throat> yeah. Well, oh, yeah. I was a I was a nurse during all of it. So everybody else that was at home doing those things of like. You know, Zoom chatting and in their pajamas all day. It took me two weeks to realize that no cars were moving in my neighborhood. And I was like, why isn't anybody going to work? And my wife was like, <laughs> we're on COVID. Lockdown, and dummy. I went, this is horse shit. <laughs> I, like, I don't want to do work. this anymore. And that's when I realized, like, I don't want my job to ever be physically tied to a physical building ever again. I don't want to have to be here or there all the mm-hmm. time. Like, like, you know, I'll go to meetings and, and meet in person and from time to time, but... By and large, I don't want to be like, I, I like my environment. You know what I mean? If I want to have some interaction, I'll go stop over in Mikey's office and say what's up, or I'll get a coffee across the street. But I don't go to the giant high school assembly every day of like adult life where it's like, you know, that's really what it feels like after a while. It's a, it's a continued group project of life where like some mm. people put in effort and some don't, whatever. And it's like, man, I want to kind of build that community of effort somehow and get, because what you're doing, right? I would assume that everybody in these endeavors really cares about what they're doing, really tries at what they're doing, right? Well, they're passionate about it. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I'm trying that to get the passion again. Yeah. And, you know, the, the passion, like we were talking about earlier, is kind of your path is having your own experiences and, and kind of getting you interested in psychology and then religion when you were, yeah. you know, going through your batch, trying to get those two bachelors. And what... Let's go. I want to talk about that because I don't think it's talked about enough of spiritual growth. And you can call your path spiritual. It, you don't have to. However, you want to kind of overuse. Yeah. But I know people that have used these substances to benefit their life, not to cure depression, not to cure their anxiety, but to level up in life and to be. Their consciousness shifted so much from an experience that they actually changed their life 
for the better and oh, got yeah. into something that they were passionate about and started following their true path. And it kind of seems like that's similar to your story in a way. Um, but is that – I'm glad you guys are doing this kind of research because no one else is doing that. Um, but is that – Spiritual growth, do you think that, that – how important is that for people to realize? Yeah, man, spiritual growth is is interesting. It's it's something that is a growth that on the surface seems intangible. You know, yeah. Like how do you quantify the amount of spiritual growth that a person has? And I mean spiritual growth, growth it, it, it sort of equates to being content with life. And I think that those two factors, like to be content with your own life, is a form of spiritual growth. Um, like, so can you give me an idea of growth that isn't spiritual, like unspiritual growth? So, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is like you go into before you take, let's just say you're in a job that you're not happy with. Let's say mm -hmm. you're like me selling cell phones in a mall or, you know, back in my 20s or or you're, you know, somebody that feels like you have the ability to do something different or you want to be an actor or you want to be uh, a computer programmer, but you just don't know how to get that. Sometimes people will use psychedelics to change their consciousness to try to figure those things out. And afterwards, they have a spiritual growth where now they can kind of see that path before them. And the psychedelics have helped them get to where they're going in a way of using it more as a tool for growth versus I'm going to cure my depression. Um, and I think that mm. th that is, uh, and not even just to let's, like like we were talking about earlier, the creativity thing, like I'm going to take this and and be more creative, and right? Yeah, um, Yellow Submarine or you know, and, Sergeant Pepper's. And some people do go to festivals and they just want to trip their ass off and and laugh with all their friends. Yeah, have but a good time. A lot of people I know use it for spiritual growth, whether it's kind of using it in an intentional sh sh shamanistic way. Um, and I'm not sure if you're super familiar with any of those things, but I just find it interesting from a scientific point of like, like you said, how do you quantify that? It's, it's an experience that's for that person. If it changed their life, it's real to them. There might be not be any scientific data that says, well, this is how you got to that there could eureka be. moment. No, there could be though. He's saying even On from the, the research with the, the VR and measuring the DMT and saying earlier with, well, if you close your eyes and listen to music and start seeing synchronous visions, you're doing the synesthesia. Like your brain is taking that and interpreting it, right? Like, yeah, no, I hate to say that, but like, it's not like that vision isn't drifting in from outer space or somewhere. Your brain is now being stimulated and it's because it's synced. You can tell that your brain is doing it. Is that right? Yeah. So when, yeah, you're, you're, you're definitely bordering on correct. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so, so there's a thing and, and, and I want to talk, I want to hit both of those points, both of what you guys said. So sign. So there's a thing called long-term potentiation. LTP. Okay. And it's essentially the idea of brain cells that fire together, wire together. And what does that uh, mean? That basically means that if you do something a certain way, then you will be, the probability of you doing it again the same way increases the amount of times you do the same thing. Right. You know? So for, for you know example, you there is an area of your furniture that you always stub your toe in. Boom. You always hit your toe and you're like, ah, oh! then you're sort of paralyzed for a little bit. Then you walk around and if you do it again, then it increases the probability, you know, or, or, or for example, let's so say something else that isn't that painful. Let's say you want to, you know, uh, dance and, and you're doing a dance sort of uh, routine and, and you increase the times that you do it. Therefore, these brain cells fire together wires together because you're doing something you're you're doing a practice but that yeah. sounds good on the surface but that can also work to your um detriment for example yeah. like if you do things like you worry about you know every single tuesday you're in bed and you're you're just worrying and you're like worrying and you're like you know oh my gosh i don't want to go into work or i don't want to touch this person then just doing that mm -hmm. creates an entire path 
yeah. of your brain to operate in. And that's called long perpetuation. That, and that increases rumination, which is the idea of sort of getting depressed over the thought of being depressed. Wow. Right? Um, and, and that increases. But with psychedelics, which is fantastic, all of these very long established pathways that our brain has, all these LTP pathways that we have, they sort of like, they sort of get a little bit, they sort of go away and they, they, they're, mm. they're, they're easily re made to different pathways. That's it right there. I mean, that's what that, I'm trying yeah. to get at with that's yeah, this, you can call it, like I said, you can call it spiritual growth. You can call it, you can name it whatever you want. The point is, is that consciously you are a different person and your life moved in a different direction after said experience. Yeah, he's yeah, he's basically and, saying that. And to kind of, uh, you know, I've heard some people say that you should do a trip every month. Like, like everybody in the world, and you know, some people, it's not for everybody, but it's beneficial to do uh, to kind of keep those brain paths from closing back up. Uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, so um, psychedelics, it increases synaptic plasticity, which basically means what I just said. It, it um, Let's say you sort of establish these like routes that perhaps are good, but perhaps are like bad. You mm -hmm. know? Uh, when you do psychedelics, it sort of releases it and makes it plastic, makes it a little bit sort of, mm. you know, flowy so that you can establish these like new pathways and, and uh, new paths and yeah. life and new paths and doing things. And also... When it comes to creativity, you look at problems. Perhaps you look at problems differently. Right. Yeah. Perhaps there's a problem that you've been thinking about, whether it's coding, whether it's some, you know, art or some type of like social problem. You do psychedelics and you look at this problem completely differently. Yeah. And yep. and, and and people that have done uh, these uh, substances, you've, you know, perhaps out there in uh, in uh, the audience, you've probably experienced this. You've you've experienced epiphanies and these epiphanies aren't some sort of like stoner thought no yeah. that's actually your brain rewiring or having the potential to rewire right. based on what you want to do right and that's always been downplayed as a stoner thought Oh, that you're just high. That's a that's ridiculous. Can you see the colors, man? Yeah, you could never. <laughs> you know, you're just high. That thought that you had, that's not going to get you anywhere. Just drop that. That's a fantasy. I you think know, that comes from scared you're just people tripping with your small minds. I, yeah. I think that comes from scared people with small minds that go, man, that thought is actually really out there, and it scares them. You're just receiving information that you don't normally receive. Things are coming into your mind. I was going to ask him like, about that. It's the muse or that was going to be my next your, question. your brain's an antenna. And now you're able to receive information because your brain chemistry is is opened up through these pathways. And that's allowing you to, you know, is where do thoughts and ideas come from? We're, we don't even know. We don't even know what consciousness actually is yet. You know, the materialist science want to go over and say, well, the brain creates... Con I don't believe that. I personally, through the experiences I've had, I don't fucking believe that for a second, that the brain is the the center of consciousness. I think consciousness is everywhere, is, and we're just taking it in well, as a Well, take the Michael Talbot version of the holographic universe, that we are a part of the universe and that our brain is the universe in and of itself, so that your brain part literally is generating. It. Well, we yeah. are all the same thing. We are all a bit of the hologram that retains the whole in the bit. Yeah. Right? Like, like, you smash up a mirror. No, a hologram, because it contains that image in every well, piece. Well, so does a mirror when you smash it up. Fair enough. That's the what he talks about. Yeah, so first off, fantastic book, The Holographic Universe by oh my God. Uh, Michael Todd. That blew our Great minds book. I read we like 21. I, I found that in a public library when I was in nursing <laughs> school where I would go, and I also got the Neil Diamond Greatest Hits album and copied. But like <laughs> that's, that's and I found Acoustic Alchemy there too, a great find. But I found that book, oh, yeah. and I remember freaking out like, yeah, we you've got to get this book. I still it's have one it of the home. reasons our buddy became a PhD in psychology. I mean, oh, that really? really influenced him absolutely 100%. Yeah. It opened my mind a lot. So I actually want to get back to the topic of, you know, consciousness. That's yeah. A very interesting topic. Yeah. And uh, actually last Saturday I was taking out with my friend Joe San. He's a fantastic postdoc from Rotterdam. 
Shout out to my friend. Uh, he's a really, really cool guy. But Heck we had yeah. this conversation actually uh, last Saturday about consciousness. And of course, you put a few scientists together at like 2 a.m. in the morning. You're going to have a crazy deep conversation. <laughs> God, it'd be and, on the wall there. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wish you guys were. But he <laughs> he thinks that there's a possibility that consciousness is really just a fluke. It isn't sort of a primary feature of us. It's just sort of a fluke in our development. Because, And the reason why I came to that conclusion is because objectively, you can explain the biology of a bacteria. You can explain the biology of a bird. You can explain why the heart beats, why the heart pumps blood into the heart, you know, all this stuff, how legs articulate so they can run away from predators. But to explain consciousness... You're explaining it, but you aren't putting objective things with this explanation. Mm. And that right there says that if you can't put objective, like an objective explanation behind explaining this biology of things, and really, if you just take consciousness out of us, then we would operate fine without it. We would be more animalistic so, or less human or because isn't that what separates us from like the traditional animal world of us from a chimpanzee? I mean, isn't that what kind of makes humans humans is our specific mode of consciousness that we operate in? So, yeah, for a long time, we thought that was true. But now we think that the sort of distinguishing factor of what makes us humans is not just cognition, but meta cognition so that's the idea of of uh if i say i think that you think something that i'm thinking whether you i i perceive your consciousness and then i assume that your consciousness is receiving my consciousness that's sort of meta cognition wow okay and i just blew my apparently mind. we're the yeah. And apparently we're the only creatures that has this ability to do this. Therefore, that distinguishes us from, you know, the other animals. But then again, you have to think like, in actuality, to be conscious is actually a detriment. It's counterintuitive to survival. True. Mm -hmm. Because if you doubt a survival action and you do something else and that's going to hurt your own survival. So in right. actuality to be conscious is a detriment of like, it could actually hurt your actual survival. So that's, that's right incredible. there, which it has many, but many that's times. That's incredible yeah. to think about I mean, in that way. The, but the ego gets in the way and next thing you know, you have a Hitler or well, you have the fall of Rome or it makes me think you of you have uh, human beings that just get too far into their own ways of thinking that, you know, it could be the fall of civilizations yeah. in the no, past. But even to the point of like the gift of fear of the book where they say like, say you're walking down the street and you see somebody and you go, oh gosh, they look sketchy. And what I mean is they just look sketchy. So your gut gives you this, they look sketchy, but societally it tells you, you can't cross the street to the other street because you're going to be looked at as you're getting away from them from their appearance or this or that. It's some societal norm you're breaking now. So now because of the metacognition we have, we have to abide by that. And then say you get kidnapped or mugged or whatever, you're denying your gut instinct and running into what your cognition has told you is okay. Yeah. Or you you have to do it because of the cognitive societal norms that we constructed and you don't listen to it. Like a deer isn't going to go walking by that lion because they have this social construct and it's like, oh, I, I don't want to get on the other side of the Serengeti. You know, I just want to be polite. And that lion's like, man, I'm going to eat, eat you up. Yeah. Like that kind of like denying animal basic gut drive instinct, I think definitely is a weird thing of what you're saying. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, it's really interesting to think that the capacity to think this deeply it's all such could mystery, be such a dude. hindrance, we too. We don't know a whole lot. Like, people can have debates about consciousness, but when it boils down to it, just like, we really don't know. Where it came from, when it started, what, you know, yeah. I love thinking about so, it. So, yeah. It's really tough. No, well, well, then, so, yeah, and my conversation with my friend Josan went really deep, and we we sort of had to break down all everything in the entire observable 
universe. And we decided that, okay, what is consciousness? Then we have to assume that, okay, in every sort of physical element everywhere, we have things that are conscious and we have things that aren't conscious. Like if we could sort of agree to that, or unless you believe in the pan, uh, the pan psychic theory, where as everything is conscious, whether it's this yeah. uh, microphone, the table, everything is conscious, but that's, that's also an idea too. But we have to be able to separate physical elements that are conscious and physical elements that are not conscious. But perhaps we're looking at that wrong. Yeah. Okay. Perhaps it isn't a polarization of conscious and consciousness. Perhaps there's an entire gradient mm-hmm. of things in between. Yeah. I can totally buy that. I mean, that makes more sense to me. Um, you know, a dog has a sort of a consciousness. You know, I look at my dog and I'm like, you sense things about me. there's some type of when you look into your your dog's eye, like there's something there. It's not like looking oh, yeah. at a mouse. You know what I mean? Like there's like thinking happening. Yeah. This dog's looking at me and thinking a certain way about me oh, or yeah. wanting to please your master in a certain way. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, it's just incredible. W- one thing I did want to go back to is Zeus, you had talked about uh, earlier is kind of the beginning of your path. And um, we love to talk about personal experiences on this show. And I got to know about the five gram mushroom does. I just <laughs> oh the first the first go around yeah, yeah. the first high dive yeah man in. I'll yeah. tell you everything man I'll tell you everything yeah so I was a sophomore at the University of Arizona I was living in this place called Star Ranch which is a, an apartment complex for college kids nice in Arizona which this is at the same time when we like I think we were like top three party schools yeah. ranked by like Playboy oh so yeah I remember that <laughs> yeah ridiculous yeah. yeah. So, of course, like on a Friday evening, my friend said, hey, I have an entire bag of shrooms. Do you want to take them? I'm like, of course I want to take a bag of shrooms. I didn't even know what shrooms were. I knew that they were a party thing. I knew that I was going to see some things. Let's make it happen. So I did it. I ate it. I ate all of them. I didn't put it on pizza. I didn't eat it with like pepper, you know, whatever. I just ate it. I just... I just I just ate a raw dog, man. The taste of shrooms are perfectly okay, perfectly fine. It's the anticipation that people believe will make them bad actually makes them bad. The yeah. the anticipation of the bad taste makes it a bad taste. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, that's called expectancy effect, which is actually a scientific phenomenon. But anyways, getting back to the five grams of shrooms, what happened when I took them? So I distinctly remember sitting on my sofa. Being perfectly fine, being okay, looking at people, like walk around, talking. We had like a little bit of a party, just sort of on my sofa, looking at people. Then all of a sudden, I just sort of teleported to the chair that was outside. And my friend Sarah was giving me a massage on my shoulder. And I don't don't remember telling her that I was on shrooms, but she sort of sensed that I was on something. Yeah, this is great. Good (laughs) Yeah, great friend. Still a fantastic friend, by the way. That's awesome. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So she was giving me this fantastic massage, and I was looking up. I was looking up at this beautiful, like, um, barren Arizona sky, just like stars, not a cloud in the sky. And then, of course, I looked up, and I saw... A figure. I saw a sort of ever-evolving ribbon-shaped figure that kept on evolving, kept on sh- um, turning and, and changing shape as I focused in on it. And it was big. It was giant. It was. It was. It probably was the size of an entire football field in the freaking sky. Usually, if you see something like this you would probably become afraid of it because it's a freaking thing that's right in front of you. But I didn't, I wasn't afraid. Perhaps I couldn't process things like fear because I was just on five grams of shrooms. And I I just saw this thing and I felt very comforted. I felt very comforted in the sense that this thing, if it wanted to like hurt me, it could have already hurt me, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. It was just sort of there of showing itself off to me, like how a peacock, would show itself off to show how fantastic it actually is. Right. And I looked at this thing and, and, and as my friend was pressing it to my shoulders, this, this thing kept on changing shape and like wow. moving and it would go across the sky. It was so illustriously beautiful. 
And and yeah, man, that 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 was the beginning of, of, a, of a fantastic trip. I remember going to my friend's house and he he had like a beer pong table set up and just booming off my brain. I, I, I just I was just looking at this game of, of these ping pongs going back and forth oh, in these red cups. And I, it, it didn't make any sense, but I yeah. love the reaction of everyone else. Everyone yeah. else had very excited reactions towards what was happening. And based on their reactions, I was feeding off that energy. I yeah. felt that that sort of energy. I had no idea what was happening. I had no idea That's why there amazing. were cups on the table, <laughs> why they were throwing balls, why they were cheering. I was just yeah. happy. Oh they were happy. They were like hugging, yeah. were jumping up and down. I'm like, yes, I love this. I love this energy. Um, oh man yeah. and it's something awesome. so simple like that like beer pong could just be the most magical thing ever god that's funny. if you're in the right state of mind and open to like it almost feels like that was kind of those people your first research subjects watching the the scientific the background transference of, of joy yeah like through beer pong yeah that's so interesting i mean it, like i said that that is a Interesting way to go into your first experience with yeah. it, but kudos, my man, because that's... And, and I would just say, like, doing that is not for everyone. Zeus is obviously a, a very unique individual and can handle that type of dose, but right. I would not recommend someone right. their first time doing five grams. I don't know uh, what I would recommend. I don't even know what a recommendation <laughs> would be. Spread it out. Take a, you know, a decent amount and then take a little bit later. You can always take... Can't ever take less. You can yeah. always take more. Yeah. Fair point. It's very true. And I also want to say that um, although I would love to say psychedelics is for everybody, psychedelics is not for everybody. Yeah. Um, let's say, for example, you have a pre-existing mm-hmm. um, sort of um, mental uh, issue that you're dealing with, or perhaps you have an undiagnosed cognitive problem or cognitive disorder that could be exacerbated or increased with the ingestion of psychedelics. Right. So yeah. uh, you should definitely understand your own yep. uh, sort of, you know, mental predisposition towards how you perceive reality before you dabble into psychedelics. Don't believe that because you have something like schizophrenia, that taking psychedelics will help your schizophrenia. That is not how psychedelics work. So although I do want to say psychedelics is for everybody, I cannot responsibly say that. No. Sure. It's sure. Not. I've seen it. I've seen it. I would say that's probably true for everything. You <clears throat> right. know, drinking's uh, not for everybody. Peanut Smoking butter's not herbs. for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Eating pizza. Uh broccoli's not for me. I will say roundly. I will not eat broccoli. My wife has still tried to get me to it, but it's not happening. And Zeus, have you ever had a interesting DMT experience that you can recall that you maybe came in contact with these entities that people are talking about? Because not everyone sees these beings. Some uh, the the trips vary, and and what I've been reading about this slow drip study is that they are kind of mapping these beings and these worlds that people get transported to. Have you had any type of experience in with DMT in that way? Yeah, no, I, I have done DMT, and I've had I have broken through to this quote unquote DMT landscape. Yeah. And I have encountered entities and 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 I have been in their uh I guess you want to call them cities or yeah. or um their crystal castles. ever sort of crystal buildings that sort of fractal like mandel broths of infinity oh, wow. that mm-hmm. are so complex, so hyper complex that if you try to focus on the details, the details get even you know, increased in, in amount of detail. So yeah, I, I've I've experienced these entities, and, and I've I I have yes, I definitely have. I love the Mandelbrot reference. Yeah. Of the more you look into it, the more infinitely it grows and perpetuates and keeps you know geometrically expanding out. Because watching Arthur C. Clarke talk about that with I think Stephen Hawking and uh, Carl Sagan on like a there's a YouTube production of it right and he's like showing a mantle brought on a computer like an old giant desktop and he keeps zooming in he's like showing these fractals and these you know these mathematical equations that are coming out of it but to hear that into the dmt portion of it of kind of that biology and nature showing us the mathematics the 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 fractals of flowers and how those petals grow on trees on we see all of these patterns in biology why wouldn't it be in us as well that infinite, that infinite, yeah. very, very true. Point. 
Now, yeah. did, did you ever Very see true. or experience that these entities were conscious at all? Was there any sort of, like, people have these downloads from these interactions. Mm. Is there anything that you took away from being in that world or coming in contact with, with them? I guess you could call them them. <laughs> yeah, so so I'm I'm probably going to be a Debbie Downer for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I believe that these entities that we're encountering... Uh, these elves, uh, as Terrence McKenna called them, yeah. uh, some, people, some people call them aliens. Uh, I believe that when we do DMT and we see these things, that it isn't because the DMT opens some portal in our brain to connect with some hyperdimensional reality that some people believe. I don't believe that these entities are actually alive. Yeah. I believe that these entities, these beings, are actually a construction of our own brains, and our brain is placing them in our sort of visual space for us to interact with. Right. I think that they're they they are complete. Uh, they're completely created by the immense power that our brain has. I, I need to reiterate this, guys. Yeah. Every person out there, our brain is capable of tremendous things, tremendous things. Just, just, just listen, just take this for example, light, right? It's the fastest, it's the fastest thing that we can ever sort of uh, capture. Light is, is, it's so fast. It's ridiculously fast. It's the fastest thing we could ever encounter in reality, right? Light, right? Light's uh, like amazing. Only a black hole can sort of capture light. Our entire body has developed a biological process to capture the fastest thing in our entire reality and take that radiation, which is what light is, take that radiation, turn it to a chemical signal, Mm. and then turn it to an electrical signal so that we understand what we're actually seeing just that in itself is an incredible process that people don't really talk about yeah but the fact that our brain is capable of creating aliens that we think that we're talking to yeah pales in comparison <laughs> to something like our eyes capturing light and changing it from a chemical signal yeah to an to an actual electrical signal that right there is amazing so truth is point. stranger than fiction as always yeah, and and yes, a, again though, here's the thing that I always go back to: if you had that experience with this entity and you went to this place, and it affected you in some positive way, and you took that experience and went on and created something or changed your life in some way, that is real to you. No, I, I'm not saying that the absolutely. entity is real. The experience is real. Maybe yeah. not the entity. Maybe it's an aspect of your mind that just splits off. And no, then but it, I think that's what you were trying to, to correlate with yeah. them was like, do other people talk about these entities? And they might. But what he's saying is, yeah, they might talk about them, but I don't believe that they're an actual entity that you're communicating with like tel- telepathically. Sure. But we could have a shared vision. We might have shared uh, psychedelic experiences if we take something together, well, right? Like LSD you could get used on to the be same... called telepathy. Okay. It was the original name for LSD. It was telepathy. Because they were having, what do you got, Zeus? Yeah, go ahead. So yes, yes. So first off, let's let's get into that because that's that's a very tasty topic of psychedelics. The this idea of shared experiences. So actually, I've had a shared experience. Actually, one time when I did DMT with some friends, uh, I think it was four of us. We all did DMT in our living in my old California living room. We all had our own like rigs. We put the DMT inside. We all timed it out. Waited. Three, two, one, giant hit, <laughs> massive hit, so heavy where your lungs are like, oh, and it tastes disgusting, by the way. Yeah. But oh, you really? Inhale it, yeah, it tastes so bad. But then you in, you inhale it, you put it down. You you have about like about five seconds to sort of you know Normal. put things down, <laughs> brace for impact before you just like zoom, you know. So we all did it. <laughs> You put it down, wait it, and we're up. We're all out, right? Oh, my goodness. And then we were just in this sort of DMT space, and we 
believed that we had a shared trip in the sense that one person was building these like orbs of like light, orbs of light in the sky. And we were looking at them as she was building them, as wow. she was making these oh things. Oh my gosh. We all, we all saw this. We all saw this happen. Right. Every single person to the point where we actually, you know, got up out of the DMT trip and we were like, man, it was amazing that you were building those orbs of light. And my other friend was like, oh yeah, you actually saw them too. I'm like, yeah, I saw that too. That was amazing. And of course we're talking about this sort of shared experience. And that was an incredible time for me. And it was something that I was like, man, what, what actually happened? Yeah. Right. But then I was thinking, but then I was thinking, oh, oh, hold up. We were all in the same living room. And this living room had light, orbs of light, lamps that were in the ceiling. Okay. We all sort of went back with our yep. eyes closed, but we still had these sort of glows of light. Sure. So perhaps that stimuli that we all shared yeah. in the living room sort of gave us this shared experience right. while we were all taking the same right. psychedelic substance. Was this the precursor to your current study? One of probably the inspirations, I'm sure. I mean, Maybe because you're doing freaking... VR, you're getting like, I mean, this might have been when your study was first born. You're like, holy cow, like. If it was, I can't tell you. <laughs> no, but that's, I mean. <laughs> no, 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 it, it actually wasn't. Uh, but it's, 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 it's something that's interesting. Uh, but, but yeah, no, that's so I would crazy. say the first, yeah, it was, it was, I think uh, the first precursor to my own, to my, to my sort of research right now is something I did for Snoop Dogg. Uh, once again, super high score. If you want to search for it on Will YouTube, but I took, yeah, I, I took a lot of shrooms um, <laughs> and like way too many. <laughs> and uh, I went to this thing called E3, which is a giant video game expo. Oh, I, I read um, this post. Yes. I love the story. Yes. Yes. And uh, listen, uh, heads up to everybody out there, uh, whatever you do, don't take shrooms and go to a video game conference. Yeah. Uh, Cause <laughs> listen to be around that many people where every single second your, your body's being touched by someone's shoulder yeah. or someone's coming at you a little bit overwhelming. So, but anyways, within this very heightened state, I went to this area called Indicade and I experienced VR within a psychedelic state for the first time. Wow. That right there inspired me to go towards the path. That That's so I'm cool. Doing. Amazing. That's so cool. And and again, a happenstance moment of like, hey, I'm going to go to this and I'm in this element, right? But maybe that's what gave you some of that. It's interesting to think of, but like how someone would typically go about testing it in a lab and how you developed your your program of going, man, that was really interesting. Like that raw data feedback. That's what I'm saying, like, even when he said earlier about the concert and the shared experiences and your DMT trip and the shared experiences, like, trying to find some of these data points to get to the studies you're doing. Because it's so different, like you said, than the therapeutics now in retrospect. It's it's really sharp contrast between the two. And the questions yeah, you're going man, it, after. Yeah. Yeah. To to approach um, psychedelic science from a, 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 a angle that isn't therapeutic is like you're like on your own, man. You totally like there, are. There's not. Yeah. I like love there's it. not a lot of blueprints out there. You, you're you're on your own. So it's it's something that. Yeah, no, thank you for for being interested. And a lot of people are interested to see where it goes, because yeah. even I'm interested to see where it goes just yeah. as a person like seeing this from the outside in, I would be interested in seeing where this stuff yeah, goes. Right. So yeah, man, it's, I, I can't assure you guys that we're on to some interesting things and that we're going to be dropping some very interesting stuff very soon. I can't wait I'm to so share excited. with you guys what we found so far. Amazing. Awesome. And I, I really truly believe that a music festival setting could be an interesting place to research because of just the, sh like we say, the shared experience, the group of once you're in that, let's just say the the fence of the festival grounds, your mind changes. You're now in this space where everybody's in it together. 
everybody's helping each other. Yeah. You need some water. Uh, I lost my T-shirt because I was tripping, and right. you know, I lost my shoes. My hey man, I got an extra T-shirt right. for you. Or hey, this guy's not doing well. Let's let's get him over here on the picnic table. And you see that hey, community. You, you, you sit here and hang out yeah. with us, mm. even though you're not going to say a word for three hours, and then you stand up mm. and and look at me and nod your head like I'm okay now. I can walk away. Right. You know, I I love helping people through difficult times. Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, highly that's, empathet- uh, empathetic person. Yeah, but also like spreading that energy is a really fun thing that I like to Being do. Being a dynamo it, is just like yeah. affecting s- as many people as possible in a positive way. Absolutely, and and making it like I met that person and they made my whole weekend. And there, there's some kind of a recipe with psychedelics and the cannabis use and and festivals where it is this kind of unique area, this one spot for a few days that is just highly strange. I mean, people have... There's always a lot of anticipation up to it. But synchronicities of like people that you might might have met the first day, and then all of a sudden you meet them at five o'clock in the morning on Saturday, and it's the same guy that you thought you would never see again. Well, again, think about going to like a football arena, a sports arena, all those thousands of people packing their 90, 200,000, whatever it is for whatever event. They all have these charged up anticipations for their side of the game, or if you go to the festival, Festival for your show, like energy is coming in there in mass. Oh yeah, to all of these brain events. power. Everybody's and when focused you take on take all that energy and then you do what Zeus is doing is you multiply the uh, psychedelic effect with that. Yeah. That's where I think you get these like shock waves of energy where people are like, you just had to be there, man. It like if strange. you weren't there, you'll never understand it. Like it's the same thing in your living room with all four of you watching the orbs of light being created. You know, uh, it's going to be tough to duplicate that for someone to ever really give them that experience. Yep. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And, and, uh, I really love your example of the community that's built when you're at these festivals, Mm -hmm. you start like, you know, three day festivals, you're out, you're all out sort of sharing the same air. Um, and people, so yeah, they seem to be more empathetic. But also, there's some research that actually shows that specifically with LSD and psilocybin, or sorry, psilocybin and MDMA, that it actually blunts our response to like uh, sort of bad faces. So, what does that mean? So, let's say you see a person that's oh. like really um, angry looking. Yeah. It blunts it blunts our response to it, meaning yeah. that we like won't get so affected by a right. angry face. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is which is with both um, MDMA and psilocybin. But yeah. the thing about that is that I believe it's with psilocybin that it actually increases our response to happy faces. Mm. That's so cool. So and I get, also you, blunts. You get drawn. People get drawn to you. Well, you know, when we had this guy as a totem yeah. out at Bonnaroo, you know, it was a magnet for but it's also for like, happy faces. Like we were the happy faces running around with E.T. Oh, sure, on, sure. As our totem, you know, with his space helmet on and but, glow sticks hanging off of him. It's like, you know, eventually we were just, hey, E.T. guy. That's everybody knew you as the et guys right and so you, it's so interesting i've never heard you that. become a magnet if you're right. happy other happy people maybe that's it well you're maybe already that was you're the already phenomenon euphoric, right? of et so everybody's got a smile on mostly at a festival there's not a lot of frowns but if you do see one you're less likely to be like if you're in a, a normal state go out of their way it looks grumpy they'll go out of their way are to you make saying them happy? good afternoon are you saying hi no you're like that that's a sign from that person from their body language of how they're resting, but it's not necessarily. I've I've been told I look very angry all the time when I'm just there. My wife will be like, "Unfurrow your brow." Resting. I'm not an face. angry or mean person. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I have a pretty angry resting face. But it's interesting that you say that's kind of muted when you're on psilocybin and MDMA to where somebody might see me and they go, "Oh, he's really happy." But they don't see my normal face. They see it in kind of like we have a Buddha head in the house. I don't know if you've ever seen this phenomena. The light will change whether it's just like a flat or whether it smiles, the way the light hits the face of it, right? So mm. it's just this perception of light changing whether the Buddha is smiling. It's a, st- it's a stone statue, but it'll literally, literally give you the optical illusion that it's smiling or not. Wow. That's how most wow, that's pretty Buddha head statues will do it. Yeah. That's very, bad. very wild. That's incredible. Yeah. But it makes me think of that correlation from the study with MDMA and psilocybin of going, 
it's giving you the same effect through the light play. Totally maybe. makes sense. How does your brain interpret the and, light play off the curvature or the musculature or the, you know, that's why so crazy. Also, man. yeah. Also, since we are on the topic of festivals, uh, I want to also tell you this one paper that dropped, I believe, a few years ago by Leo Roseman uh, from Imperial College London. And he actually found out that LSD has a fantastic effect. In the sense that, let's say when you listen to like really good like beats, whatever, like you know Led Zeppelin or who, who, whatever band you really like, you know, sure. that when you're on LSD, it does two things: that those tunes that you hear actually you you essentially um, you are enriched by it at a mm -hmm. higher pace, at a higher rate, and also since this enrichment is happening. It also enriches the actual LSD experience. Oh, so it's a twofold process. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it totally they both makes use sense. the same reward pathways. That right. makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but wow. it, again, it does it just reinforces the concert and the festival uh, mentality and those big again like life changing shared experiences where you have all these factors, like what you were saying about the E3 or the gaming convention you're at or whatever is like you know, if he the exact taken... opposite of a sensory deprivation tank. <clears throat> like but, we're going to drop you into sensory overload on every scale of touch, sight, sound, smell, taste. Like, but it does feel like mushrooms and LSD are like different times, like different places. If Maybe if Zeus would have taken LSD at that, he would have had a totally different experience. Could have been. I mean, mushrooms have always been kind of like three, four people around a campfire kind of vibe, where LSD is like, let's go to Bonnaroo, let's go to Coachella, let's mm. go to Burning Man and get after it. Mm. Um, it it's, it's a different vibe. Yeah. You know. And yes, what you, that's very important. In the sense that, we, like, you know, any person that has tried these substances, you can tell, you know, if you ask a person, is it is a trip, is a um, LSD trip different than like a shroom trip? They're going to say, of course they are. Like, you know, an LSD trip is very distinct. Shroom trip is very distinct. MDMA is very distinct. But in science, we can't discern why hmm. they are different. We really? don't understand That's why. Yeah, we, we cannot put together. But subjectively, you ask any person, Anecdotally. an LSD trip is different than a shroom trip. Yeah. But we cannot figure out why. And perhaps it's that the precision of tools that we have, they aren't precise enough to discern right. whether these substances, you know, are per, perhaps we believe that they're hitting the same areas of the brain, but perhaps it's a very, you know, tiny, different, pus, you know, anterior part or posterior part that we overlooked or, or you know, something, you know? Right. So, yeah. so, yeah, like it's, it's, it's still a scientific uh, mystery. We don't really understand why an LSD trip is different than a shroom trip. It, it, it appears that it's, ha that it's in the brain. Like it's, it appears that the same things happening in the brain. Yeah. Wow. And like uh, yeah. Terrence McKenna had a good way of kind of painting the picture of the difference between mushrooms and LSD was mushrooms are kind of this ancient technology that's been used by indigenous people forever. It's been around a long and time. if you imagine a mansion fully furnished, vases, chandeliers, couches, and LSD is kind of like when you just move into a house <laughs> and there's no rugs, there's no carpets, because it's kind of like this, you're still painting the picture, you're still adding the furniture because it's mm. such almost like a technology. It's a newer technology. Yeah. Uh, to where it just has these kind of like open, but mushrooms have this way of like, it's a more internal experience versus like an externally visual experience. Yeah. Um, and it's different for everybody, but. Well, I'll tell you this, if Zeus in the future, you guys start developing like uh, something like genre from Westworld. I don't know if you've ever seen that show with, uh, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I know what you're talking about. When yeah, he takes yeah, genre. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. I do know what you're oh talking about. Yeah. Yes. I was asking Mikey too, yeah. but uh, just thinking about that with the VR of like, you'll be able to take this psychedelic in the future that'll be able to like, you know, transport your realities where you're like in the 50s and like it's all black and white or something like that's just who knows. With with what's going on and where we can oh, get to so those exciting. points. It's so exciting. You know, sci uh, sci fi usually kind of gives us a a, a goal, the future, uh, 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 the reach or the grasp beyond our reach, right? And then eventually we're like, shit, we're holding this. Holy cow, we're holding this thing. 
Like, and if, that's exciting. If only I could tell you what we're working on. You're good. You're good. <laughs> hey. Hey, we'll have you on. Uh, I'm a glutton. I like to actually wait. We, we I'm like good on anticipating. Okay. We like a little mystery. I love it. Yes. I, I always. Okay, okay, okay. I don't need everything right now. I'm. Okay. Uh, this research I'm gonna is. I'm going to keep it on layaway, and I'm going to be very happy it. when it comes out. It's worth the wait. Yeah. It's worth the wait. Absolutely. And we'll yeah. keep in touch. And obviously, anytime you want to come on and Door talk about open. Uh, any new research or when your findings come out, we'll stay in contact. And, uh, you know, we can keep this relationship moving forward. Uh, you know, Bub, Bub has mentioned uh, being a test subject many times. Uh, <laughs> I'm interested, to, man. To I'm wanting, just, I like to explore myself, my thoughts. I would, you know, I've been in because a lot of the studies, they don't want people that have already experienced psychedelics. So... A lot of the studies I've noticed, maybe not recently, but they want, um, I guess, psychedelic virgins, if you will, people that well, you want have a raw no landscape pre consisting. So, you know, if it ever came to the opportunity where they want more experienced people, uh, you know, we have some folks that would be perfect in our network for those kind of studies. <laughs> I just again so, I think it's fun to explore consciousness from the the standpoint of like what is it my brain generating and if so okay what's the harm in that like you can get a hot fever where you hallucinate right you can have all kinds of like natural things happen where you might hallucinate get a uh, get a kidney stone and get a kidney infection you know get a UTI those things will make you hallucinate yeah. I've had patients in the hospital fighting off UTIs imaginary sure. small men in the hallway that weren't there and I told a patient once he said, well, you got to clear them out of there. I said, sir, I don't disagree that you're seeing them, but that does not make them real. And this dude literally stopped and was like, touche. And he immediately started like doing things I was asking then because he realized like, I'm not saying that you're not seeing these little red dressed devil men out in the hallway, but it's not real to me. I'm not saying it's not real to you, but it's not real in the real sense. And he's like, that's fine. I can go with that then. You know, so I'm just interested in those. I've seen a lot of patients over the years, too, where I'm like, what's going on there with certain just mental illnesses, too, of like, where are you at in there and how are you getting to these thoughts? Like, it's just interesting to me. Our brain is so powerful, like you've said before, too. It's just we've not gotten Such deep enough on it to realize this Dude. machine of energy just sitting in our own skulls every day. People don't realize how absolutely powerful their brain is like it's 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 just something that people need and if people really understood the the actual power of their brain it feels like that would essentially empower people to do things with their brain absolutely um because it doesn't it doesn't look like like it, it it actually would and and that's the thing that i try to do is of course psychedelics are fun to talk about but it's also an excuse to talk about the brain and how the mm-hmm. brain operates. Just the brain by itself is a very psychedelic process. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I literally think every time I've had a conversation about psychedelics, consciousness in the brain always 100% pop up. It's all interconnected. Without understanding oh. psychedelics, you have to understand the brain. Consciousness is a natural thought while you're under the influence of psychedelics, these are the things you think about. These are the things people ponder. That's why the Eleusinian mysteries in ancient Greece and, you know, Brian Mirescu with the, uh, the book that he wrote, um, that talks, talks about, you know, all the ergot found in these mm. wine v- glasses over, over time. You know, people, religions have basically been started from these ancient kind of inner working closed network secret societies where people have been exploring these things forever, which we never realized until uh, The Immortality Key is the name of that book, Brian Mirror Rescue. Hmm. And uh, his work is groundbreaking with ancient civilizations and their use of psychedelics. Um, You know, the Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, John Marco Allegro thinks that Jesus and Mary Magdalene and all them were really, it was mushroom fertility cults. And that was the early times of, of Christianity. So are these visionary states of Moses and the burning bush Maybe Parting the burning the bush sea. was the acacia bush, which is rich in DMT. You know, uh, it's just fascinating that maybe the religious experience and religions themselves maybe came from the use of psychedelics. Had a touch of that. Who knows? Wow, that's wild. That's really wild. I could see it if I was there back in the day and we're like, hey, Dude. man, we got a loaf of bread and one fish. How are we going to make this happen? Here's a mushroom. Get some ergot bread Listen. out and everybody's happy. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> sorry. I'll, I will uh, tell you what, man. Like, Every single religion, everyone out there, Hinduism, Judaic mysticism, Christianity, paganism, everything, 
there is always this sort of it's like hidden history of like psychedelic use. Sure. Every single one, especially Hindu mysticism, which oh, yeah. is, I'm not sure if you guys, it's, it's very, very sci-fi, but also it's based on people drinking this stuff called Soma, mm-hmm. which is supposedly this, you know, substance that makes people do things and, and makes people see things. They still can't figure out what it was. The oracles that, at Delphi, that, whatever they're taking in to have yeah. their visions. That recipe of whatever Soma, and that's what Brian Mirarescu talks a lot about in his book, like what was Soma? What was it? Hmm. They were trying to find evidence of of like vases in these wine containers and and uh more knows, than likely man. it was a mixture of cannabis opium and some type of like ergot mixture wow um but it's a strong brew they don't know and those <laughs> Jeez. it was basically the precursor of the Eleusinian <laughs> mysteries wow. in india and also the reason why cows are sacred in india right is because they were flipping over cow patties and and you know psychedelic mushrooms are growing on them well, I was reading the article about the the Thai pink buffalo mushroom and finding those in Koh Samui from your uh, what was the double blind mag right the um, mm, online. Yeah. I found that to be yeah. interesting too. Of just oh, these grow naturally everywhere in this part of Thailand on these buffalo patties, and it's just like yeah, what the heck? Like you know, you hear stories like that growing up around. We grew up around a lot of farms. Mike and I did. So oh, you know, mushrooms grow on cow patties. Not that I ever went looking for them because I'm like not. Back went through a bunch of cow shit to go find this at whatever time, but um, just the substrate that they grow in, the nutrient dense, you know, we've had people come on before that have a pretty strong understanding of certain uh, mycelium networks Mr. out west. E, Cryptids yeah. of the Corn, we have a uh, podcasters here in Ohio, Cryptids of the Corn, and he's a former biologist and used to work in Ohio rivers discovering new species um, and has done a lot of research on mycelium networks and fungus and, yeah. um, you know, he's never even tripped before and he's under the impression that these elves that you see is the consciousness of the actual mycelium network itself and that somehow like you're, you're trip, yeah. communing and he's never experienced this. He's never, but uh, as he goes into how advanced these mycelium networks are and that they're actually essentially like a brain neural network, but it, you know, in just a kind of a different way. Oh, just the, yeah, I see what you're saying. But I digress. Um <laughs> Zeus, I was. This has been incredible, by the way. We are having a blast. I was about to say we could keep um, you for three more. Yeah, hours. Yeah, but uh, I think we, uh, you know, I think we could wrap wrap this I up. I think so because save something for uh, future discussions. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but Zeus, we always want to give you um, let it, let people know number one where we can find you, and if you have any last words for our audience, the floor is yours. Yeah, man. So first off, fantastic um, interview, guys. You guys did a fantastic job. You kept the um, energy up. You oh, kept thank the questions you. going down. So I appreciate this whole process. It didn't even feel like two hours or three hours or whatever it is. I can keep on going. Yes. Uh, but I really, I really, really uh, like it. So you guys did a fantastic job. Uh, so if you want to find uh, what I'm doing, what am I doing? What is Zeus doing? Well, you can follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Tapato, although it may change to like x.com. But at this point, it's twitter.com slash Tapato. Um, you can find me there. Uh, I talk about psychedelics. You can also find me on Instagram if you want to hang out and look at the crazy things that I do out here in uh, Europe whether I'm going to Paris or whether I'm going to some party in Rotterdam talking about consciousness with my friend Yosan. Shout out to Yosan. <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> and you can follow me on uh, Instagram, instagram.com slash Zeus Tapado, uh, Z-E-U-S-T-I-P-A-D-O. Of course, uh, Twitch, twitch.tv slash Zeus Tapado. And of course, tapado.com, which, is, which has all my research on it. Uh, it's, it's, I think it goes right to my uh, link tree. So go to tapato.com and you can see all my stuff. And of course, guys, the uh, part two is going to be coming up pretty soon. Uh, when, whenever I'm comfortable dropping some research, I, I'm definitely up for coming back on yes. and talking to you guys about Hell what yes. I am gonna drop on the planet. That Beautiful. would be great. Anytime, anytime, man. Yeah. Just let us know. Cause we Absolutely. know obviously with your time zone, your head, what, how many hours right now? Uh, so right now it's 11:30 p.m. There you oh, go. Man. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. I say I was watching the sun right go down earlier because I was watching <laughs> yeah. the contrast on the screen and everything, and Zeus was having to brighten and darken. And, yeah, but um, yeah. hey, man, was, yeah. we appreciate all your effort yeah, in making you. this happen and 
We appreciate your research efforts, I love it. man. Absolutely. You, you're doing things that nobody's doing, which is why I think Bob originally resonated with you on Twitter. And then once I started digging I like into your edge. work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and like I said, there's these new up and coming young guys like Zeus that are out there doing the real work, doing the the work that people aren't touching on. So we, we appreciate you so much. Yeah. And um, this has been fantastic. It's amazing. Um, I wish you all the best in your research, and I hope that when you're ready, we can get that set up and we will really get another good episode and just blow people's minds again because yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Uh, I had a great time just conversating. Um, absolutely. Thanks a lot, guys. And I do want to say one thing before I um, bid you guys adieu. Uh, and I want this is, goes up to everybody, guys. Listen, we are all human beings. We're all humans, and and it doesn't uh, matter if the person in front of you cut you off or if the person on the side of you stepped on your shoe. Appreciate that person because you will you won't find another human being like that in billions and billions and billions of years if you travel the entire observable universe. You will not find a an, an person like that. So please. Treat each other with respect. We're all humans. We're all on this planet together. Let's 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 you know make it happen. Let's take it easy, guys. Absolutely, man. I'm with that vibe. Everybody's highly unique. I, yep. I love that. Fantastic. Well, Zeus, don't go anywhere. We're gonna come back and bid you goodbye. Say goodbye to you. Uh, we're gonna outro the show. So s stay right there, and we'll be right back. Um, again, thank you so much, brother. Everybody. Zeus Tapato. Amazing. Dude, that was Amazing. <laughs> Incredible, man. I that feel like I sick. just got Christmas again. <laughs> like Christmas literally. in July, baby. My Psychedelic ass, Christmas. My wife or anybody asked me what I want for Christmas this year, I'm going to say the next episode of this, hopefully. Yeah. Well. You know what I mean? Like that, not putting any pressure by any means, but. But I like that. Idealistically thinking, I can delay Christmas until next July. I like looking forward to the release of this. I, I love to have something like this oh, to look forward to a future pumped. episode where we can dig into it when it all comes out. Um, but, uh, you know how I had a truly good time. I'm the guy that never gets hungry, right? And you're hungry. I'm starving. <laughs> your brain. Because this is like when I went to programming school and like, I would come home and be like, I would look at my watch and be like, how the hell did I burn that many calories? I didn't even do anything. I sat in a yeah. chair all day yeah. and I looked at my heart rate was at like 130 all day. Cause I was stressed by my, like, I was right. dropping weight like you would not believe, but I couldn't eat because I was I mean, so anxious. Yeah. Now, that just like wore me out mentally in a great way. Like that was just such a good mental workout. Yeah, it was so fun. Uh, well, guys, we're going to sign out. Um, you know, you guys can always find us at The Strange Road, Instagram, TikTok, yep. uh, Twitter, and the Facebook group is rocking. Again, if you guys love like our channel, share it with people, get the word out. Go check out Zeus. All of his things, Please check all of his, his links out. are going to be in the show notes. So go check that out. If you're interested in, in reaching out, you, you can you know where to find him. Right. Um, and, you know, the, we're going to be back. We've got some fantastic stuff coming up for you guys. Yep. We've got some... We're all over the place. The hits don't stop right now. we got now. psychedelics, ancient It's raining strange, and more we don't have an umbrella. Cryptid episodes coming out, paranormal episodes coming out. Right. Uh, so stay tuned, guys. This Soaked has been awesome. strange. Um, but we're out of here. Peace, love, and chicken grease. Thank you, guys. Adios. Adios.